Well, hello and welcome to Hearth and Home's OTR Visual Radio. I'm Mr. H. I'll be your host for this evening. Tonight's compilation is another great detective grab bag featuring Let George Do It, starring Bob Bailey, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, and The Adventures of Sam Spade Detective, starring Howard Duff. Now, if you stay till the very end, we've got a special bonus episode of Burns and Allen featuring Howard Duff as Sam Spade, and it's a really fun show to listen to. Well, tonight we've got some great shows that were hand-selected by Mrs. H., so we're sure to be in for an enjoyable evening. Now, just before we get into the show, I do want to take a minute to tell you about a couple ways you can help support the channel. First up, we've got the Johnny Dollar Club, starting at just a dollar a month. You can help keep these great shows coming. You've got three ways to join. Coffee.com, buymeacoffee.com, and patreon.com. The links for those are in the description below. And many of you have asked about using PayPal, so if you prefer PayPal, the first option, coffee.com, is a great one for you. And the second way you can help support the channel and get a little something for yourself is to check out our Hearth and Home shop on Etsy. We've got a great assortment of old-time radio-related merchandise, including the Yours Truly Johnny Dollar collection. We've got the old-time radio detective mug series. And our newest collection, starting right now, is, is the Harold Apple Knocker collection. The link for the Etsy shop is in the description below. Head on over and check that out. But now, without any further ado, it's time to sit back, relax, travel back to the 1940s and 50s, as we enjoy Let George Do It, Yours Truly Johnny Dollar, and Sam Spade. And as always, thanks for tuning in. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Earl Foreman, Johnny. In Sarasota? That's right. Florida? Where else? Well, hi, Earl. How are things in the land of infernal sunshine? What do you mean, infernal? Well, it's got pretty hot down there these days, isn't it? Makes good fishing weather, Johnny. Yeah, but without a case to work on, what possible excuse would I have? Maybe I have one for you. Oh? Yeah, and maybe it's murder. Earl, I'll be down on the next plane. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Life and Casualty Company Branch Office, Sarasota, Florida. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Parley Baron matter. Expense account item one, $131.50. Transportation and incidentals to Sarasota, Florida. Knowing Earl Poorman, I didn't bother checking into a hotel, but instead took a cab to his office in the Conroy building. Tall, lanky, easygoing, he welcomed me like a long-lost brother. Oh, Johnny, you're looking great. And I'm glad you're here, because you can clear up this case in a hurry, and then you and I can get out in the Gulf and do some real serious fishing. Oh, well, that's okay by me, Earl. Your last trip just... down here, you remember, they weren't biting so good. But, oh, Johnny, so help me now that... Oh, I see you've got your bags with you. Well, uh, yeah. Good, yeah. because you're going to stay with us out the house. Now, I'm not going to take any argument. I told that old battle axe I'm married to to hang out an extra towel for you. How is wife? Oh, she's great, just great. I never did understand how I was lucky enough to grab that dame, Johnny. Oh, well, now, I think maybe she kind of cares for you, too, Earl. <laughs> now, uh, about yeah, why women we call... show funny tastes sometimes. Hey, maybe the old horse will go fishing with us. Mike? Yeah. Anything over 10 pounds would pull her right out of the boat. <laughs> but now, what kind Listen, of a problem? she's been getting pretty good with a rod and reel. Look, look, will you? This fishing right. talk is just making my mouth water. First, I'd, we'd yes, better discuss... Yes, I, I, I know. Once I get started on fishing... I know. All right, now, let's is... get down to cases, huh? Uh, oh... All right, if you insist. I insist. Yeah, all right. Okay. I was just trying to stall off having to. You know where Lido Key is? Well, Lido? Yeah, a mile or so offshore, ju just beyond St. Armand's Key, where we live. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, a client of mine, a man I've known for years. He retired, bought himself a piece of property there, built a nice little home on it. H his name is Parley Barron. So? Well, I've handled all his insurance for him, including a straight life at 50000 Uh-huh. Beneficiary? His wife, Flora Barron. And what's happened to him? Well, Friday morning, now that's the day before yesterday, he left the house just to do some errands. Well, go on. Yeah, well, 
He hadn't got back home by about 5 p.m., and his wife started calling around, trying to find out where he was, and nobody seemed to know. So finally she put in a call to the police. Who was your man there? Uh, Sergeant Harry Brackett. Oh, I remember him. Sure. Go on. Well, then around 7 p.m., they found Barron's car. Found it parked down by one of the fishing docks. But no sign of him? Not a sign, not then or since. Had he gone out fishing? Police questioned everybody, the boat owners, all the boat livery, everybody. Old Will Bright, who runs the dock where the car was parked, he was closed up. Sign on the door saying he'd gone up to Gainesville. Well, could Barron have had any reason to disappear? Oh, no, no. Well, not that anyone knows of. What kind of a person is his wife? You know, you no, know, she's very sweet, Johnny. She's a bit of a bore. But, oh, they doted on each other. All right, how about enemies? Parley Barron? Never. Sweet old guy. I sure hope you can find him. I, that he's still alive. I'm afraid I, I doubt it. Well, so far you've given me no reason to believe he's dead. Well, it's just a feeling, I guess. And I don't like it. Uh, well, what else can you tell me, Earl? Nothing, really. Then maybe I'd better talk to Mrs. Barron and to the police. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here. You take my car. Oh, thanks. It's the new air-conditioned cat out in back of the building. What did you do? Oh, Michael picked me up. Now, we'll see you at the house for dinner, huh? Well, that may depend on what I find out in the meantime. Whenever oh. you're ready, there's food and there's a bed waiting for you. And I hope you... Well, I just hope you find Parley Barra. Pretty good friend of yours, isn't he? Oh, yeah, Johnny. He was. Earl seemed so sure that Baron was dead. I was pretty down in the mouth about it. But I wondered, did he know something about the old man that he hadn't told me? Ah, that didn't seem like Earl. He gave me the Baron's address on Lido Key and I drove out there. Laura Baron was a fragile gray-haired little old lady wearing steel rim spectacles and with well, with almost a sanctimonious air about her. She sat primly, properly straight in her chair as we talked, a Bible in her hand. Then Mr. Earl Poorman has told you as much as any of us knows, Mr. Dollar. I see. But uh, even the smallest bit of information may hold the key to finding your husband. Only prayer can help us now, Mr. Dollar, or help him if he's gone to the great beyond. How, uh... Well, tell me, how is he dressed on Friday morning when you last saw him? As you see him in the picture there on the table in old gray pants and a rather tattered sport shirt and that old straw hat. That shirt is blue? Yes. He was so happy the day that picture was taken. he just finished making an addition to our dock with his own two hands. He was so proud. Now... Yes, I, I'm sorry. He'd hoped to get his own little boat, too, for fishing. He loved to fish so. Yes, well, uh, tell me, please... Do you know of anyone who might have wanted to harm your husband? Oh, dear, no. No, Mr. Dollar. And you'd had no, no argument or disagreement with him before he left here that morning? Huh? We had had no disagreement even about little things in 41 years of blessed marriage. Ah. Not even about his work. I see. Uh, what did he do before he returned, Mrs. Barron? Oh, I, I had hoped you wouldn't ask that because I, I've always felt that the good Lord wouldn't approve. Of his work? I'm a very religious woman, Mr. Dollar, and as I say, in 41 years, we never questioned one another's thoughts or actions, but... What was your husband's work? I, I won't say that it was sinful, because he wasn't a sinful man. Parley was a good man, and many times he made it plain that his work helped to save lives, too. And I accepted it because he felt he was doing right. Yeah, well, you still Yet, haven't told me, Mrs. Barron. Always deep in my heart. Mr. Dollar. Yes. Have you thought that perhaps it may have been the intercession of divine providence that has taken Parley from us? Uh, <clears throat> no. But no, you I... must consider it, mustn't you? Because the workings of the power that guides our destinies, our birth and our Mrs. death. Mrs. Barron. They are sometimes too mysterious for us mortals fully to comprehend, much less question. Well. And so... If my beloved Parley has been taken from us for some 
divine purpose or for something he might have done unknowing that was not in accord with the supreme Mrs. will. Mrs. Barron, I'm sorry, but I would like to know what your husband's work was. I know, and perhaps it was my humble mission on earth, the cross I had to bear to guide him away from it to <sighs> chemicals. He was a chemist, Mr. Dollar. Explosives. Explosives? Yes. Heaven, please forgive me for not having led him into some other Where field. did he work? Tampa. Dufresne Chemical Corporation. Dufresne. Oh, yes, I've heard of it. Explosive things to kill in defiance of the Almighty's purpose that we love one another. Yeah, but we... now how, uh, how long ago was this? He retired in 1951. And since then? Here in Sarasota. Uh -huh. And to keep himself occupied. Oh, this lovely home of ours and his fishing, though he never caught anything. Oh, I see. Never caught anything, Mr. Dollar. Do you suppose that that was some retribution for the work he had done so long, for some error in his living or thinking? Well, I... <laughs> well, who knows, of course. Yes, who knows. But we should consider it, shouldn't we? Uh, you know, uh, where did he do his fishing? He never told me, but he left here almost every day to try his skill. And always he came home empty-handed. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, thanks, uh, Mrs. Barron. I'm sorry to have had to ask you so many questions. It's all right, Mr. Dollar. My faith will sustain me through this ordeal. I'm sure it will. Thanks again. Here, you must take some of these pamphlets with them. Oh, Read them. Really? Any aid to piety of the mind is good for all of us. Yes, well, thanks. I... The inspired word may help us all. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I like to think that on the whole, I... Well, maybe I'm not too religious in the sense of going to church regularly and that sort of thing, but... Well, at least I try to live a decent sort of life and observe the golden rule and stick to some ideals. And But in an atmosphere like that, well, I couldn't help wondering if her husband didn't have good reason for wanting to get away for a while. In any event, I'd got nowhere on the case, so I phoned Sergeant Harry Brackett. That's item two, ten cents. But the desk at headquarters said that he wouldn't be back until about 6 p.m. And since I really had nothing to go on until I could see him, I dropped in on Earl again. You're kidding? Then we'll take the boat, run out into the Gulf, and get some fish for dinner. It's the best time of day. So who was I to refuse? And within the hour, we were fighting the tide through the pass between Lido and Longboat Keys on our way along into the Gulf. Yeah, Johnny, I find I always have my best luck along about this time of day, just before sundown. I still ought to be back there working. Why? Sergeant Brackett won't be back at headquarters until 6 o'clock. You told me yourself. Now, what can you do until you talk to him and find out what leads he may have? Oh, man, you are a funny one. You call <laughs> me long distance to get down in a hurry, then insist I go fishing instead of working. Don't you case. know? Fishing's the answer to more problems than anything else in the world. You got worries? Go fishing. You'll forget them. Got a nagging wife? Oh, don't let Mike hear you say that. <laughs> well, she's different. Cute little shrimp. But you know what I mean. A writer, he wants ideas, he goes fishing. A businessman, a detective, huh? I go ahead and say it, an insurance investigator. <laughs> sure. I'll bet that more than once when you've been stumped on a case, why, if you had just relaxed your mind by going out somewhere and wetting a line... I wish you were that easy. And so far as this matter is concerned, I haven't even got started on it yet. Well, relax, anyway. Who knows? Maybe the answer to what's happened to poor old Parley Barron will, will, well, will just come to you. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, sure, sure. Instead of you chasing... Earl. Huh? Yeah? Up ahead, just to the right there. Where? Oh, yeah. Somebody's old beat-up straw hat. Yeah, and a little further. You know something? The tide will carry that skimmer right smack into the Earl, sea here. And if the fellow that lost look, it knows... further over to the right. Huh? What is that floating there? I don't know. Well, it looks like... Oh, good Lord. Johnny. It's a body, Johnny. We'll drift over to it. It's a body, all right. And that straw hat looks exactly like one I saw in a picture this afternoon. Here. I got it. Can you reach him, Johnny? Yeah. Here. Here we go now. Oh, good boy. All right, now let's see. Oh... Is it? Yeah. Are you sure, Earl? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, Johnny, it's poor old Parley Barron. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Everyone loves kids, and every kid loves candy. American servicemen have heard the tearful cries for candy in most parts of the world, in Europe and the Far East during World War II and after. And there's never seemed to be enough candy to go around. Well, more than a dozen years ago, during the Berlin airlift, an Air Force lieutenant from the United States discovered he had no candy to offer some German children. However, he promised to drop them some candy the next day as he came in for a landing. Improvising a parachute out of his handkerchief, Lieutenant Gail Halverson dropped the candy bars the next day as he had promised. Now, this idea caught on among other Air Force men in the airlift, and that's how Operation Little Vittles began. The idea spread far and wide, and soon military personnel, civilians, business firms began to aid the goodwill program by supplying candy and handkerchiefs. Time after time, as the sleek cargo planes of the United States Air Force swooped low over the landing field, a shower of little bundles of sweets dotted the sky as their Tiny parachutes carried them safely to the ground, and the hungry German children gathered up these bundles of mercy, which the communists try to keep from them. The men of the United States Air Force did a great job satisfying a lot of appetites, but they did more. By a wonderful sense of understanding, they nourished the cause of freedom, the right of all men and children everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Parley Baron Matter. Two days' exposure to the elements and the creatures of the sea had made almost unrecognizable a body that Earl Porman and I found floating in the Gulf of Mexico off Sarasota, Florida. But Earl was certain it was the remains of old Parley Baron, who had disappeared two days before. The men on duty at police headquarters confirmed the identification and placed the body in the morgue to await the autopsy surgeon. On a hunch, I asked Earl to drive me over to Will Bright's boat dock, where Barron's car had been left parked. It's like I just finished telling the police over the telephone. I wasn't here when poor old Barron come for his boat on Friday. Oh, what a shame, such a nice old man. Where were you, Mr. Bright? I was up to Gainesville, picking up some fishing tackle from a wholesaler. Well, then Mr. Barron must have got a boat from someone else that morning. Oh, no, 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 sir. No? No, for him, no sir. Why not, Mr. Bright? Oh, he never took out a boat from anybody else but me. His own boat. Uh, at least it was the one I kept set aside for him. And that's what kind of puzzled me, Mr. Dollar, is it? That's right. Well, you see, when I come back to you Saturday night, his boat was right here at the dock. But it weren't tied up in its usual spot where I always tie it up. Somebody had moved it. Must have. And it weren't my helper, Pete. You no, know, Johnny, that means he may have taken it out, but whoever did him in returned it. Oh, possibly. Mr. Bright, which one is his boat? Oh, right here. I'll show you. I always give him the same one. Never let nobody else use it. That's why he kept his fishing tackle just laying in it, always ready to use. Here. Yeah, I see. I've heard he wasn't a very good fisherman. No, no, he never brought in the thing. Of course, maybe he was so soft-hearted he put back everything he caught. Or maybe his daily excursions were just to get away from his wife, Mr. Bright. Now, don't you say nothing against her, mister. Maybe she is a little touched on religion. Sure, she tries a different kind every couple of months. But she's a fine woman, uh, just like he was a fine man. And everybody knows it. Yeah. The whole town is mourning him. Excuse me. What are you looking for, Johnny? Well, I just noticed something about this tackle lying in the boat. Mm-hmm. Well? Come on. Thanks a lot, Mr. Bright. Like to tell you what I think might have happened? Yeah, maybe later. Thanks. Well, what did you what did you find there, Johnny? Earl, did Parley Barron ever go fishing with you? You were good friends. No. No, he always wanted to go out alone. Yeah. But not to fish. Huh? That tackle box hasn't been moved in months. The paint is still dark under it. What? And that reel, I could hardly turn it. Well, then what? I don't know what. 
But Baron was using that boat every day for something besides fishing. Any ideas? You know him pretty well. Have you? No. Let's get over to headquarters. Earl felt he ought to go back to his office where his wife, Mike, had promised to pick him up. So I borrowed his car again and went over to headquarters alone. Sergeant Harry Brackett was assigned to the case had returned. It was on the phone when I walked in on it. Gets back to town, Mrs. Dana, so please have him call me immediately, will you? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, sir, what can... Johnny! Yeah, hi, Harry. Yeah, Johnny, I'm sure glad you're here. I got a real mixed-up case on my hands. The Barney Barron matter, huh? Well, you know about it? That's why I came to Sarasota. Earl Foreman called me. Have you found out anything? Nothing much of you. Well, only what's here, the autopsy report. What's in it, Harry? Doc Snowden says that Parley Barron was dead before he was put into the water out there in the Gulf. Oh. No water in the lungs, you see what I mean? It probably means murder. Have you told anybody this? No, not yet. Why not? Well, I don't know. Maybe because I just can't figure anybody in the world would want to kill Parley Barron. Did you talk with Will Bright down at the boat dock? Just before you came in. You know, it sounds like somebody went with Barron in his skiff that morning. Killed him, dumped him over the side, and then brought the boat back alone, doesn't it? Yeah, except for one thing. Pete Marino, a little kid who plays around Bright's dock all the time, is sort of a self-appointed caretaker when Bright isn't there. What about him? Well, Peter saw Mr. Barron take off in his skiff Friday morning, alone. But he didn't see him come back. Pete went home for lunch. When he got back, the dock skiff was in. Uh Uh-huh. Then whoever did it met him out on the water somewhere. Maybe several people, so that one of them could return the skiff. Be taking an awful chance, wouldn't it? Well, how do you mean? Yeah, Doc's in a pretty isolated spot, all right, but the killer showing up in Baron's skiff without the old man long, that's too much of a chance. How else could it be returned? <sighs> Tied. Tied? Little Pete says that when he got back to Doc, the skiff was there, all right, but not in his usual place. So Will Bright mentioned. Also, it wasn't tied up. It was just sitting there. Oh, then you meant untied. No, I meant T-I-D-E. When the tide's rising, it floats everything from the past between Lido and Longboat Keys right up to Will's dock. You think the boat just floated back by itself? You got a better idea? Harry. Yeah? Are you sure it was Baron's body we picked up out there? After all, the fish and whatnot disfigured it pretty badly. Honey, I've known him for years, and didn't Earl Pullman recognize him immediately? Yeah. And the clothes he was wearing, his own straw hat. Well, have you checked on his dental work, things like that? I'm waiting now for Dr. Dana. He was his dentist to get back there. You know, that's a funny thing. Why? I called Dana the minute that body was brought in. Yeah. After all, teeth are about as solid identification as you can get. Oh, I thought you were sure anyway. Well, I wanted to be doubly sure. Anyhow, when Dana didn't get here right away, I called him again. I got his wife on the phone. And according to her, he suddenly left for Tampa. Urgent call or something. Where in Tampa? She didn't know. At least she wouldn't say, but it, it seems kind of fishy to me. Well, it may just be that one of his patients... Daner. That's right. The man who got so much publicity about atomic radiation studies, effects on the teeth and so on. That's the one. What's the matter, Johnny? Well, when you're stumped on a case, says Earl Foreman, go fishing. We did. We found a body. What are you getting at? Me, when I'm stumped, I play my hunches. No matter how crazy they may seem. And the hunch I have right now, man, is the craziest. I'll see you later. I learned a long time ago in this business, when you got a hunch on the line, you play it for all it's worth. Item three, ten cents for a phone call from a booth in the drugstore just around the corner. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Dana? Uh, Yes, this is Mrs. Dana. My name is Larkin, Mrs. Dana, from the Federal Bureau. The Federal Bureau... That's right. So you can see why it's important you say nothing to anyone about this call. Well, how can I be sure you are? I'm simply checking to make sure your husband has followed instructions. Oh, I see. Has he left for Tampa? Why, yes, the minute he got the phone call. Did he tell you who called? Why, no, but I did hear him mention the name Dufresne. Dufresne? Yes, only he didn't know I heard. Oh... Maybe I shouldn't have mentioned it. Just be sure you don't mention it to anyone else. Oh, no. Goodbye. <laughs> Item 4, 390 at the sign of the Flying Red Horse on the way to Tampa. The least I could do for the use of Earl's car was fill the gas tank. On expense account, of course. The FBI gag had worked before, so I used it again to bowl my way through the gate at Dufresne Chemical Corporation and to the office suite of Dufresne himself. I wasn't at all surprised to see activity in the suite, despite the late hour. 
are you the man the front gate just called about? Yes, that's right, FBI. Which is the door to Mr. Dufresne's office? Well, I'm afraid he has some people with him, sir. What did you say your name is? Never mind. Is this the door? Sir, please, we'll have to wait. Come in, Mr. Dollar, come in. Oh. I'm Arnold Dufresne. This is Dr. Dana, and this is Mr. McLaughlin of the Federal Bureau. How are you? We've been expecting you. Oh, uh, have you? Sit down, Dollar. I guess this is your show now, McLaughlin. My credentials, Mr. Dollar. First, I suppose I should prefer charges against you for impersonating a member of the Bureau. Uh, yeah, well, I... I can uh, hardly say that I blame you, though, under the circumstances. Incidentally, our man in Sarasota's had quite a time keeping track of you. You mean there was a tail on me? From the moment you arrived. No kidding. Well, we didn't dare take the chance that you might upset things for us. After all, you've a reputation for being pretty sharp. We should have anticipated that you might be called in on the case, but though we planned things very carefully, we, uh, well, shall we say, overlooked you, even as we almost slipped up with Dr. Dana here, who would identify that body. Look, will you please tell me what this is all about? A man named Poorman called you in Hartford and asked that you come here to investigate the disappearance of his old friend and client, Parley Barron. Right? Yeah, that's right. Now, where is he? What happened to Barron? Do you know? We do. And we were afraid you might find out and let the... Uh, Shall we say, cat out of the bag? That is why we were all ready to send for you to come here, but, well, as it turned out, you came all by yourself. Uh, Mr. McLaughlin. Harley Barron, by the way, Mr. Dollar, is all right, alive, healthy, and happy. Then that body we picked up, dressed in his clothes? During the last war, Mr. Barron, as a research chemist, made vitally important contributions to our, or shall we say, national security. Oh. He was too valuable a man to lose, even though his wife objected to his work for religious reasons. Uh, yeah, I uh, gather that from talking to her. Or perhaps you even thought she might somehow be implicated in his disappearance. Uh, the thought certainly entered my mind. Well, in any event, so that he could continue to have a happy home and at the same time carry on his tremendously important work, we arranged for the little deception that has been going on for some years now. His so-called daily fishing trips. That's right. But each morning in a small hidden cove, I needn't tell you where, he was picked up and brought here to Tampa to carry on his work. <laughs> well, I'll be done. No one was the wiser. Even our, shall we say, uh, competitor nations in atomic and missile research who were bound to keep tabs on such a man, they knew only that he was working for the Dufresne Chemical Corporation. They and that, did know that. Huh? Well, we must suppose so. International espionage is pretty well organized these days. Mm. But uh, now this disappearance, Mr. Were changes in plans for nuclear developments had made it mandatory that he spend some time in, uh, well, elsewhere. Where? Well, shall we say somewhere in New Mexico or something like that. So to openly send him there would have indicated to our competitors what these new developments could be. That had to be avoided at any cost. Therefore, the plan for his disappearance was carefully worked out and carried out. Then whose body was it we picked up? Well, some poor, unidentified old derelict who was on his way to Potter's Field. I see, I see. <laughs> well, believe me, if the Bureau functions this thoroughly in everything it does... Oh, we try. But well, what about Mrs. Barron? Oh, she'll bear up. We, of course, made sure of that in the beginning. And then when her dear husband does return... Well, what will it be? When his work is finished. And, of course, that'll be too late for our friends across the sea to catch up with us and... We've worked out a completely plausible story to cover his absence. Oh, I'm sure you have. Now, Dr. Dana here will return to Sarasota in the morning. He will confirm identification of the body that was fished from the sea with only uh, sufficient reservation to protect his professional reputation when Parley Barron reappears. All right. Now, when an insurance claim is filed on Barron... Well, I'm sure Mrs. Barron won't file for some time, unless urged to by your friend Poorman. No, I can prevent that without telling him anything. That's fine. What's more, with the pension that some companies have for, shall we say, slow action on claims? Well, don't let them hear you say that. Well, Baron will be back before you need to worry about it. Now, is uh, that okay with you, Mr. Dollar? Um, shall we say, okay. And once more, I tip my hat to the FBI. <laughs> Expense account total, including plane fare and incidentals back to Hartford, $421.50. Remarks? 
For obvious reasons, I have used fictitious names throughout this report, and of course delayed filing it until obtaining official clearance. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a strange old character, the most beautiful girl I've ever met, and money all over the place. Counterfeit. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Jeanette Nolan, Will Wright, Barney Phillips, Lawrence Dobkin, Stacey Harris, and Harry Bartell. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, uh, did you ever hear of anyone who was afraid of an angel? Now, I'd always heard they were pretty nice people with wings and harps and stuff. But not so with Lefty's gal Friday. She had this angel as figured packing forty fives, all aimed at her. Now, instead of getting panicky and chewing her nails until she resembled Venus to Milo, she should have looked up George Valentine. His motto is let George do it, and he isn't afraid of forty fives or even forty sixes. I must say, however, she had a reason to be scared. You see, she played a big part in building this angel. And just in case you've never seen an angel being manufactured, listen, and you'll get it firsthand. Extra, get your paper. Let the lump it kill an auto crash. Law couldn't get him, but wet pavement did. Here you are, left the lump it. Big shot. You say your name's Emerson. You heard me, Mr. Valentine, Frank J. Emerson. Oh, but you're the president of... That's right, young lady, Emerson and Citibank. And I'm a very busy man. I only want to know if you've read about Lefty Lumpert's death in that auto accident. Sure, who hasn't? Naturally, naturally. When the biggest crook in town dies, it's news. Young lady, but I know what sort of reputation Mr. Lumpert was supposed to have. Well, just because they could never nail anything on him, not even the income tax. Board. Of course, yes, yes, I know. But I must remind you that Mr. Lumpert owned a perfectly respectable small investment office. <laughs> Invest in a dog track or a five-foot shelf of bookies. Perfectly respectable, I said. Regardless of whatever criminal connections or power Mr. Lumpert may or may not have had, that front, that uh, business of his, was proven many times to be perfectly... Yeah, perfectly respectable. I heard you the first time. Okay, okay. Lumpert was real smart. He worked alone. He never told anybody anything. His ostensible occupation was strictly legal. There. That reassure you? Well, yes. I just wanted to make sure... Only, uh, what's it to you? Why so insistent? And why should a banker like yourself be concerned with Mr. a guy... Mr. Valentine, my bank has done business with Lefty Lumpert many times. Oh? And never mind that tone of voice, either. A dollar is a dollar. Our money was only used in legitimate purposes. It's not up to us to refuse business to a man merely because he's supposed to be engaged in other outside activities, is it? No, really, let's not be naive. Oh, no, no, let's not be naive. All right, Mr. Valentine. It's embarrassing. Of course it is. Business is business, and I have nothing to be ashamed of. But, uh, well, I've never liked it very much. Then why are you here? Why does Lumpert's death oh, mean... Oh, no, no, no. Don't get the wrong idea, please. There's nothing I'm really worried about. But you see, he had a secretary, Myrtle Dane. And through the years, I've got to know her pretty well. Myrtle Dane? The one who was in the accident with him? That's right. Probably as close to him as anyone could ever be. At least anyone from the legitimate end. She's quite a person, Myrtle. <laughs> She's uh, rationalized working for him much better than I have. A very realistic person. Very good secretary. 
If she knows anything about Lefty's more private life, she's certainly never let on. Wait just a minute. The newspaper said that Miss Dane was hurt. She was driving, they were going to an appointment and in a hurry, but the steering wheel saved her. Banged up and shaken a good deal, yes, but not badly enough to make her behave irrationally. What do you mean? I've just been to see her at the hospital. Normal, friendly act, that's all. But she refused to see me. I forced my way in, but it didn't do any good. For some reason, Mr. Valentine, the girl is terrified. She's even afraid of me. Uh Uh-huh. What do you want me to do about it? If there is any scandal or kickbacks or new discoveries about Lumpert's activities now that he's dead, I'll admit I want to protect my own name and the name of the bank. But also, Mr. Valentine, I think it's my duty as a citizen to wonder, why is she afraid? You know, I think that's a pretty silly question. Now, if you'd taken part in bumping off the town's leading gangster, how would you feel? Now, don't start looking for the nearest cave, because I want you to hear this. Now, let's see how George is doing with Myrtle. Nope. She's still standing her ground. No, I don't want to see anyone. I told you. They brought you some candy, dear, in the doctor. Please, nurse, how many times Hello, do I Myrtle, have to... Myrtle, how are you feeling? What? Uh, will you excuse us a minute, nurse? Yes, Mr. No, come back here. I told you. I... <laughs> Sorry, but she's a friend of Miss Brooks here. Hello. Who are you? What do you want? Nothing. Brought you some candy. Take it away. Get it out hey, of here. Hey, take it easy. Myrtle, look. It is just candy. That's Won't all. not blow up or anything. Uh, a little nervous, aren't you? I'm sorry. The nurse called you Mr. Valentine, didn't she? You're George Valentine. I know you're all right. I... There's a hall full of flowers and fruit and candy out there. Lots of people have been pestering you, huh? <laughs> Suddenly I'm popular. At my age and with my face, can you imagine? Who sent you? Emerson. Oh, the banker. Well, you can tell Mr. Emerson that I am not just another working girl out of a job. I have been very well paid. I don't want another job. That I am taking a year off to take a trip around the world and will probably never come back to this town or ever talk about the time I've spent here. Hold on, hold on, will you? I don't believe you. What? Mr. Valentine, the doctor says I can leave this hospital in about ten minutes. And I tell you, I'm going straight to the airport. I know, I I know. Sure, you're running away fast. But to work for a guy like Lefty Lumpert, you must be a very sharp and cold-blooded girl. Certainly smart enough to know that people will raise their eyebrows and say, oh, she only worked in his legitimate enterprises, huh? Running away, huh? Keeping her mouth shut. You wouldn't believe me one way or another. Any more than anyone else would when I tell them I know nothing about Lefty's criminal connections. No, you're wrong again. I do believe you. Thank you. A dollar is a dollar, you know. But it takes some rationalizing to work at a job like mine for so many years. And ignore the other kind of remark. Whose remarks? What makes you so bitter, Myrtle? Oh, no, you don't. My personal life is still private. Big Shot dies unexpectedly. Faithful, tough private secretary is suddenly scared to death. Why? Well, that's the only reason I'll believe you didn't really know anything about Lefty. Because now you don't even seem to know whom you should be afraid of. Mr. Valentine... There's an assistant district attorney by the name of Bill McCoy. Do you know him? No, but I can certainly find him. Find him and meet me at Lefty's office. Give me an hour to get dressed and checked out of here. Why? (laughs) Because the two of you are like cold water in the face. Oh, no, I'm not afraid of Bill. Maybe you've just reminded me of my debt to society, that's all. Is he the one? Bill? What one? I'm not very good at double talk. Yes, you are. (sighs) Because I'm doing it right now, of course I am. He's the only person who hasn't come to see me. Bill McCoy. All right, so I'll go see him. And we'll all try to solve the riddle of Lefty together, shall we, Mr. Valentine? Well, that's the general idea. I'm scared, Mr. Valentine, but you're wrong. It's not because I don't know whom to be afraid of. No. And it's not any mysterious partner of Lefty's either. It's an angel. I'm scared to death of Lefty's angel. An angel, George? Protect her, Brooksy. That's what she was talking about. She means a guy like Lefty couldn't get along without someone to protect him from higher up. Oh, someone respectable. 
Maybe that's why the police could never get anything far enough. Hey, hold it. Huh? Hey, you. That's not the way you get into a hospital, is it? Through the fire entrance? You make up the rules or something? Oh, but I got friends on this floor. That brightens my whole day. Now get out of the way. Hey, look, that's an operating room. You want to visit that? Eh? Only a couple of private rooms up here. Hey, maybe you're mixed up. At least my friend doesn't want to see anybody. Come on, come on now. I'll show you the reception desk. Yeah, I got business to attend to, now get oh, out no, of the Oh, no, you don't. I'm going to see you and you can't stop That's me. That's what you think. All right, all right, cut it out. Mistake, see? It. That's all. On the wrong floor, I guess. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Come back here, you. See you again sometime. George, what on earth was hey, that? Stop being tough when I bumped his chest when I noticed he carried a gun. Oh. She afraid of an angel or a devil, George? Hey, look, get to the police and give them a description of that guy, will you? And check the reception desk on everybody else who's tried to see Myrtle. I got a hunch this case is going to go off like a string of firecrackers. Did we keep you waiting, Myrtle? Found your friend here in the barber shop. Hello, Myrtle. Hello, Bill. <laughs> well, that's a friendly greeting. Why did you want to see me here at Lefty's office, Myrtle? I thought the big investigator might enjoy a chance to search through Lefty's private papers. Well, McCoy, it seems like the place to start if we're going to try to find out who his angel was. No, no, I just thought it would be a good idea. Hmm? We're too late. Somebody beat us to it. Look. Holy smoke. Yeah. Looks like a typhoon went through here. It was like that when I got here a few minutes ago. Filing cabinets open, papers all over the floor. Yeah, and any incriminating papers just plain aren't here anymore, Check. I've never told this to Bill, Mr. Valentine. But Lefty always said the law would never get him. He had an angel watching over his shoulder. Yeah, an angel who just tore this place apart. Yes, that's the point. Lefty was no fool. If there was such a person, then somewhere he must have kept a file on him to protect himself. Only where is it? Oh, cut it out, both of you. He didn't keep it here. Huh? How do you know? If his own secretary is... I was more delicate, but I ransacked the place myself two nights ago. You what? And there wasn't anything here then, Valentine. Two nights ago? The same night you took me to the movies? Oh, now take it easy, Myrtle. And you said you had to go home early to get some sleep? Mr. Valentine, do you know how many years this waste basket from the district attorney's office has been trying to get something on my boss? Do you know how many laws he's broken himself? Cut it out, will some... you? A job is a job. Yes, isn't it, though? Like, like taking me okay, out and... Okay, never mind. You're on opposite sides of the fence. You don't like each other. Myrtle, he's dead now. Please, oh, won't you... Oh, it, will you? Hey, Myrtle, did Lefty have a safe deposit box? Yes. I know where the key is. You know what's in that box? No. I suppose you won't believe that either, Bill. Oh, for the love. Look, Myrtle, the thing I've been trying to do ever since he died is to round up that muscle head of his, Murphy. I don't know anything about him either. I've only seen him once or hey, twice. Hey, hold on, will you please? What's all this? Who's Murphy? The other side of Lefty's life, bodyguard, Aaron Boyd. Myrtle's right. He never hung around the legitimate end. Murphy is a big, ugly guy with one cauliflower ear, which is probably the only ear that's ever heard Lefty in private with whoever he dealt with. Wait a minute, I'll get that. Hello? George, I'm down at the police station, and I gave them a description of that man in the hospital. Oh, Brooksy, yeah, yeah, I, I already know who he is. You do? Just caught on this minute. His name was Murphy. He's the link with the angel. Maybe Lefty's only link with his angel. Hey, watch this. Who are you talking to? Mr. Valentine, you mean you've seen Murphy? Wait, wait a minute, Brooksy, listen. No, George, you listen. You wait a minute. Do you know that they found Murphy ten minutes ago in an alley? Do you know that Murphy's dead? That he's been murdered? <laughs> Say, this angel really gets around, doesn't he? Or is it Lefty's angel? Could be that uh, eager beaver from the DA's office. I wouldn't know. I only know a good thing when I hear it. Just like you're going to right now. Lefty Lumpert, the big shot no one could ever nail, least of all Bill McCoy, the DA's man who's always handled the case, is finally dead from an automobile accident. But what's to become of Lefty's mysterious underworld empire? 
Well, the secretary who handled Lefty's legitimate business says that Lefty had an angel, a protector. But she doesn't know who it is, of course. A faithful bodyguard named Murphy might know, but he's just been shot to death. So if your name is George Valentine, you know that now it'll take some fast flying to catch up with an angel. But, Brooksy, where was That's the... That's all I know so far, George. The police are down there now. It was in the alley, just a block from the hospital. So it must have happened just after we chased him away from Myrtle. Okay, Brooksy, stay there at headquarters. I'll meet you later. Hey, Myrtle, you said you know where Lefty kept his safe deposit key. Yes, of course. All right with you, McCoy? Sure, if Lefty had a file on the angel... Okay, somewhere. then let's go. Sometimes files have teeth. <laughs> bigger size boxes. At least he had plenty of room for this stuff. Miss Dane, Mr. Valentine. Hold it. Well, well, hello, Mr. Emmert. And McCoy, I noticed you people come into the bank. I hurried over as fast as I could. Thanks, but I don't think we need you. Left your safe deposit box. That's what you're after. Any objections? Well, no, not at all, as far as I'm concerned. I've got the authority. I'll take the responsibility for approving it with a court order. Well, my signature's on file as Lefty's secretary, if you'd rather we handle it that way. No, no, no. Go right ahead. Yeah. You just wanted to watch him. Huh? Okay, here goes. Hmm. Plenty of stuff. Well, these are just income tax things. Yeah. How about this? Oh, wait a minute. No. No, it's the same. And these are audits from the investment office, see? Bonds, 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 bonds. Brother, look at this. I know we had a lot of money invested in buildings. There's a million here. bucks worth here, or I'll eat it. Lefty never talked much about his money. Say, look, let's not be naive, Emerson. Lefty couldn't have made that kind of dough with his legitimate business. Of course not. Not a tenth of it. So you prove he had other enterprises. So what? We already know that. Oh, come on. This is no good. We're wasting up. A... Hey. Yeah. Dusty little envelope down at the bottom. Acme Rental Service. Here, let me have that. All right. Take it easy. Ah. A key. Nothing in it but a key. Well, it looks like a house key. We can trace it all right. There's a date on the envelope. Acme will have a record. Sometimes I've called Lefty at his house and there wasn't any answer. I mean, lots of times when he was supposed to be home... And he his wasn't... own home is pure as driven snow. So, maybe you had another house. A place nobody knew about. The guy playing it safe would keep a duplicate key in the bank. Okay. I'll see you later. What? I'm running over to Acme. Valentine, you worry about the murder. Running down Lefty's other life is my worry. Well, well. After all this time of getting nowhere, the heroic DA's man steps in... Sure, I'm after a headline. So what? Skip it, and I'll call you back in an hour. So you want to know about Murphy's record, eh, Valentine? A guy like Lefty can be a smart lone wolf, but not a strong man. Sure, that's the idea, isn't it? So you ask me about the weak link strong Johnson, man. Johnson, what's eating you anyway? Oh, nothing. Murphy was just as smart as his boss. Never been locked up, never had friends, never hung around bars and shot his mouth off. So he's dead and we might as well forget about him. You want to know something? I bet he didn't even know anything about any angel. Just left these big, faithful muscles. Then what's all this stuff on your desk here? Angels. I'm starting a list of angels. And do you know how many there might be? What do you mean? The DA's office always thought Lefty played it alone, like a genius. So now we get into it. Because there's murder. And what do we find? Well, Emerson at the bank has dealt with him for a long we time. We find a corporation executive who played cards every Friday with Lefty for years. A real estate king, a fire chief. My friend, I'm telling you, there could be an angel behind every cloud. Okay, okay, Johnson, I get it. Now, which one is it? His lawyers, that's the best bet. Big, respectable outfit. Ask them to call back. Hello? Oh, uh... Who is this? Here, give me that phone. Take the extension. What is this, a date bureau? Hello, Myrtle. Mr. Valentine, did he call you? Who? Bill McCoy. He was going to. He was going to call me, and it's nearly two hours. No, no, he hasn't, Myrtle. Say, where are you? I called his office, but they haven't heard from him, and I stopped by his apartment, but nobody answered. Listen to that. Everybody's getting into the... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Myrtle, I'll ask the police well, to... I checked the Acme place, and they gave me the address he went to. It's a houseboat. What? But I still can't find Bill. Amateur detectives. Listen, lady. Mr. Valentine, come out here fast, will you? That's where I am. Lefty's hideout. The houseboat. Pretty fancy place. 
Yes. Rigged strictly for business, though. It's where he must have handled his contacts and things. Well, there's certainly nobody here. Say, was the door open like that when you came here? Well, yes, I haven't touched anything. I don't care about that. I was just thinking about keys. Well, what do you mean? Well, if a guy's careful enough to keep one in the bank, chances are there's only one other. Left his own key. Well, that was in his pocket in the wreck, George. Lieutenant Johnson checked the number of it for me. So the only key loose is the one McCoy has. So he must be the one who left the door open. But why? Unless he was in such a hurry. Take it easy, will you? He means quite a lot to you, doesn't he? And vice versa. No. No, I hate him. Always following me around. Hey, wait a minute. You notice the wall safe? What? Here, behind the table. George, it's been left open, too. Uh Ah, by somebody who knew the combination. Johnson can tear this place apart now, but I'll bet he won't find anything. Whatever there was is gone. Bill, I don't care about that. What's happened to Bill? George, yes. Whoever opened it had to know the combination, so it couldn't have just been Mr. McCoy that was here. He could have found it that way. Or he could have found somebody else here and taken the stuff out of it and headed for the DA's office. Oh, no, you know that's not true. George, if the angel was here too... Stop jumping to conclusions, both of you. Come on. You heard me, no. Hasn't shown up at his office. Hasn't phoned anybody. Look, Johnson, what about asking the traffic department? They can't find him either. They're checking taxis now, but no luck so far. Hey, where are you going? McCoy's apartment. Try to get some more leads on him. George, look. McCoy! Hey, McCoy! Bill! Oh, you're wasting your time. Look at the bureau and the closet door. I'll say. Somebody sure went through here fast. No neckties on the rack. Drawers left open. Uh Uh-huh. No razor blade. No toothbrush. George! Yeah. No suitcase in the closet, either. Somebody else must have been here, don't you think? I mean, it seems to me most likely... Hey, what are you doing at that fireplace? Get away from that... No! Yeah. Ashes. Papers. So you try to step on them and put... Burn, whatever they are. Hey, Brooksy, shut the door. Get rid of that draft in here. Maybe I can still make out this. Yeah, that's what they are, all right. All right, Myrtle, look. Whose handwriting is that? I don't know. A second ago, I thought you were scared because you thought McCoy might be dead. Now, come on, whose papers are these? I don't know. They're burned so badly, okay, I can't Okay, you won't tell me, but I know somebody who can. Naturally, I've seen Mr. Lumpert's writing many times. I doubt if the lab will get much out of them, Valentine. But that's what the papers were, all right. Records of payoffs, dealing with gamblers, the whole works, whole underworld empire. Lefty Lumpert, his records. Except for one page concerning his angel. Mr. Valentine, no, it, it, it can't be true. He wouldn't His have. angel by the name of Bill McCoy. Well, it's happened before. No one in a better position to protect him. The investigator who somehow could never find anything. Until today. And then he destroyed it as fast as he could and ran. Well, that does it. I got all the evidence we need. Uh Uh-huh. All over but chasing down McCoy. And Myrtle, you'll feel different when we find him. And if we hurry, I know how to do it. Once you said I was tough, Mr. Valentine. Well, now you know why. Take it easy, take it easy. You rationalize yourself into taking a job like mine with Lefty. You deal with phonies. And the first nice guy who pays you a lot of attention. Turns out to be a phony, too. It's that kind of a word. I know, I know. You said you knew where to find it. Uh-huh. Yeah, I phoned the River Patrol to meet us. Who? Lefty Lumpert's underworld business is still really intact. Those ashes won't tip off any names or places. And it's a good business. Worth continuing. You mean... You mean you think Bill is... I mean, suppose Bill wasn't the angel. He was really a partner of Lefty? Suppose there wasn't any angel. After all, you're the only person who ever said there was one. What? Just like you made a big show of being frightened. To prove there was one, I guess. But Lefty so often If Lefty wasn't a lone wolf, the way everybody else figured, then the only possible associate was you. Mr. Valentine, I really... You're tough, all right, sister. Suppose that's what Murphy knew. Suppose that's what he wanted to see you about. You, the new boss. What? Suppose that's why you shot him in the alley near the hospital where he waited for you to come out. Shot him to quiet the only person who knew your real position. This is the most ridiculous oh, accusation. Oh, wait a minute. Except Bill McCoy, of course. Sure. The man who was breathing close to the truth. 
And that's where we're going now, to drag the river real fast before the mud and silt keep us from finding his body forever. His body? Sure. But, but he was the angel. You, you saw Lefty's own Private file Private secretary him. for years. That forgery would be a cinch for you. Just like you had time to murder McCoy there at the houseboat. Then tear over and fix up his apartment to look like he'd run away. Burn those papers, but leave just enough stop so we think... Stop it, stop it. I won't listen to you. If we find his body where you dumped it, then there's no other way it could work, is there? Yes. Yes, there is. Like, you could keep on driving right across the bridge, oh, right out of town. Put that gun away, sister. And never mind attracting any attention to speeding. You see, there's no reason for me to do all those things. Why would I? Lefty was my... Where did he come from? What are you trying to Right behind to us, sister. Head of the traffic department. I asked her to pick me up. What, you... Oh, no. Careful with that thing, sister. I'm going to ask the department to reinvestigate that accident of Lefty's. The one with you driving. Because that'd explain everything, wouldn't it? If this case really had three murders. Well, Myrtle, those policemen are getting out of their car... You've only got about two seconds to make up your mind what you're going to say. You know what I'd say if I was in Myrtle's shoes? Bye. Of course, you couldn't count on it working. Not to the extent, anyway, that you can always count on this. Mr. Valentine, you don't count very well, do you? Oh, yes, I do. Three murders. Because everything that's happened would make plenty of sense. If you maybe happen to give Lefty the extra blow after that accident that supposedly killed him. Or you could have rigged the accident I by... I said you don't count very oh, God, well. No, give me that. Oh. oh, yeah, I can still count. So can you. Three murders, I said. Not four. First Lefty, then Murphy, then McCoy. Real tough woman, Brooksy. But she wanted to take over Lefty's empire. <laughs> Simple as that. Well, at least one thing tonight, George. I noticed this case made you stop calling me Angel. Yeah. You have just heard another adventure with George Valentine. Robert Bailey starred as George, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, have you got any skeletons hanging in the closet? If so, dig them out and set them by the radio, because we have a dandy story that's going to make them feel right at home. It's called Uncle Harry's Bones, and it's complete, all except for his floating ribs he lost somewhere between 18th and 19th on Chestnut Street. Now, where they keep Uncle Harry's mortal remains, only time will tell. Besides, George Valentine has to have something to do for the next little while. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to go around saying, let George do it, which would not be good since that is his aim in life. Anyway, if the maestro will throw us a bone in E-flat, we'll get on with the epic. My dear Mr. Valentine, you will please report to me at the Sturdivant Farm. That's two miles down the road from Pine Lake if you turn right at the Red Silk Post Office, or the house with the unpainted shutters if you come over the hill. I want you to clearly understand that you're working for me, no matter what anybody says. And Lordy knows the people around here know how to say things. For instance, they all say Uncle Harry is their uncle, but he's not. He's mine, and nobody else's. <coughs> Mr. Valentine, please come quick. My trouble is, I don't know if Uncle Harry is Uncle Harry, or somebody else's who's not important. I've got to find out, now don't you think? 
Sincerely, Sophie Sturdivant. Hey, friend. Hey, you. What's your trouble? Hello. We're looking for the Sturdivant place. Oh, well, down the road, past the hill. You're looking for Doc Sellers. He's just gone into town, I think. Doc Sellers? Who's he? No, it's Sophie Sturdivant we wanted to see. Oh, Sophie. Her. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, nothing. Doc's your brother. He's all right. Well, what's the matter with her? Nothing. Okay, thanks. Look out for your foot. Hey, hold up, hold up. Don't see many strangers around here. Where are you from? Looney Bin? Uh, Looney Bin? Sure. Uh, Sophie's all right. What are you driving at, Buster? My name's Dorky. What are you driving at? Say, so tell me something. Where does Sophie's Uncle Harry live? Who? Uncle Harry. Some kind of a character around here, I get it. Nope. No Uncle Harry around here. But she wrote... Hey, look. Were... This is a nice, peaceful place. People don't like strangers making trouble. None of my business, none of yours. But well enough alone, I say. You'll live longer. You know what I'd do if I were George? Go back to town. Ah, but not fearless Valentine. Besides, he's got Brooksy there to help him. Just like I've got this to help you. Now let's see if George and Brooksy took the old-timer's advice to get out of town. Nope, I guess they didn't. Because there they are, walking up to Sophie's front door. It's kind of a run-down place, isn't it? And all the places around here seem to be, George. Yeah. Mrs. Sturdivant... The door's open. She's probably out back in the kitchen. Uh -huh. Mrs. Sturdivant? Sophie! Hmm. She's not in the kitchen, George. Of course she isn't. Huh? Oh, what do you think does the cooking around here, anyway? Uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah. We didn't mean to walk right in. must be Doc Sellers. Well, I ain't Abraham Lincoln. You looking for Sophie? Uh-huh. I'm George Valentine. This is Miss Brooks. I've seen your car out there. Just come in myself. Hey, sis! Come to the party. You're a doctor, are you? Sure, sure. <laughs> Want a pill? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, pretty good size, eh? <laughs> no, I haven't practiced for years, but I still got these. I was over trying to unchoke a neighbor's horse yesterday. Eminent sawbones, that's me. Uh huh, you're a vet. Yep. <laughs> Retired livestock killer. Sophie! Hey, so! Well, upstairs, I guess, working on a butterfly collection. Come on through. Sophie, for the love... She must have fallen down the stairs, George. I'm all right. I'm Here, all right. Get her over to the couch. I'm all right. Um, Ziox, what'd you do? Trip over your own feet? Oh, yeah, let me. She didn't fall downstairs. Huh? Yes, I did. That's what I must have done. But how did your face get those blotches on it? How'd you get that black eye? <laughs> No one hit me. What'd you say that for? I mean, I, I fell, that's all. Look, did somebody slap you, knock you no, down? No, 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 no. Well, who was it? Why? When did it happen? Oh, stop it. Stop it. We've come to help you, Sophie. So why won't you tell us what... Oh. Huh? Huh? What are you looking at me for? No reason. Just wondered why she's still so scared. Oh, no, that's ridiculous. Doc's my brother. Oh, hey, Douglas! Douglas, come on in here. Is Douglas with you? Yeah, I just got back from looking at the old office. Oh, what did you find? Nothing, not a blame thing. Oh, look, both of you, what are you talking about? Yes, Doc, what is it? What do you want? Hey, Valentine, Miss Brooks, Douglas Kent. Just as you know, I'm not the kind of man who beats up his own sister. Uh, how do you do? Hi. I... Sophie, what's happened? I'm all right, Douglas. Doug, here's another crazy, eager beaver like Sophie is, Mr. Valentine. Going off half cock whenever mm -hmm. he gets... Mr. Valentine's here to help us. Isn't that right, Sophie? He's here to help find out. Oh, look. Will somebody please explain what this is all about? No. No, I I think that perhaps I was wrong. What? Mr. Valentine, I shouldn't have been so hasty in writing. Uncle Harry, that's what it's all about. Uncle Harry? No. No. Douglas and I only thought... Oh, be quiet, so. You started it, let's finish it. Come here. I'll show him to you. Show him? Uncle Harry. The great Uncle Harry, so they say. Yeah, see for yourself. <gasps> skeleton. Nothing but a skeleton. 
Uncle Harry's bones. Says you. I was out fishing in the lake, Mr. Valentine, and my line got tangled, and here he is. But just a skeleton. I don't see how you can tell. Who was Uncle Harry? Man disappeared five years ago. Man who bought out the breeding farms, a hermit. Sophie's uncle. Uh Uh-huh. Well, look, I don't know much about anatomy, but is a shin bone supposed to look like this? Well, go on, Doc. Tell him. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Jump to conclusions, yeah. I made the mistake of remembering that I once set a fracture for Harry, that's all. It's what I get for playing M.D. We've been downtown looking for the x-rays in Doc's old office. We were going to the barn, too, to check in his old trunks and things. You see, I thought that if we could find the x-ray that he took five years ago, it might give us a positive way of identifying... Bones the... are bones. It's not going to tell you anything. How about this? piece of rusty wire tangled around his leg. George. The lake is full of stuff. It don't mean anything either. But it means something if we knew his leg was tied with wire before he died. Exactly, Mr. Valentine. That's just the way yeah, I... Yeah, see, everybody who reads mysteries goes off half-cocked. Well, what kind of a skeptic are you, Doc? Why don't you think it's Uncle Harry? Mister, I don't think one way or another. Only lots of people come up summers to fish in that lake. Could be practically anybody. Okay, Doc, I'm going to go with you to keep looking for that x-ray. Douglas, get the local sheriff up here as fast as you can. And tell him to send for a police x-ray man, too. Brooksy, take care of Sophie. Look, I- I'm just as upset about Sophie as don't you are. Don't bother, but... Doc. I finally got the idea. It's a skeleton in the closet we're after. Well, come on, then. We're going to start opening doors. Set the blame leg in the first place if there was a real sawbones around. Lasted bunch of recluses in this part of the woods. Yeah, sure. I... Did you try this box here? Old Sears Roebuck catalogs. Yeah. Blasted cobwebs. Hey, how about the tin one? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, let me see. Your x ray stuff ought to be boxed up somewhere that you could find hey, it. Hey, Doc, where are you? Oh, is that you, Sheriff? Right here. Yeah. Come here, meet Mr. Valentine. Worse than cleaning out an old attic. Bye. Don't stick your paw at me, young man. Wow, wow, wow. What's your trouble, Sheriff? Don't you like to know what's going on in your territory? I know all about it. Don't need any city boys to come telling me what my job is. Uncle Harry disappeared five years ago. Let's leave him that way, I say. Uh Uh-huh. You're not interested in skeletons, huh? Sheriff, I think I'd like to have a little talk with you before we... Oh, quit your blab and give us your pocket knife. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just airtight box. Maybe you got it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, that looks like negatives. That... Hey, look out for that spider. <laughs> yeah, open up closets. Got to expect to be in bits. Here. Let's see. Uh-huh. Oh, that's, that's a horse, isn't it? Uncle Harry, horse, spider. What difference does it make? Uncle Harry. There you are. Can't name day, chin bone. That's him, all right. Here, let's get it in the light. Well, Doc? Well, it could be the same as the skeleton. Yeah, looks the same to me. Set crooked on top there. Like a hundred others, I suppose. Holy smokes, Mr. Valentine, I can't tell for Sheriff, sure. did you get that police x-ray man? Yeah, over at the house. Mr. Kennedy. Okay, give me that x-ray. Come on. Absolutely. There's no question about it. But isn't it true lots of people have broken bones, Kennedy? I'll be glad to swear before a jury that this is the same bone. Before a jury? Of course, Mr. Valentine. Hasn't anyone here noticed the fracture in the skull? Mm. Here, right here. Why, no. Enough to cause death, I should say, in that location. I will also testify that the fracture must have been made before the body became a skeleton. In other words, the X-ray proves it's Uncle Harry. Precisely. And the combination of fracture and wire around the legs unquestionably proves that he was murdered. There you are. Quite simple. Murder. I knew it was Uncle Harry, all right, Sheriff, but the important thing is, who did sure, it? Sure, sure, Sophie. Now me and Mr. Mallantyne have Wait a minute, to... listen to her. Young lady, I've known Sophie for years, and anything... But she knows you... who killed him. She what? Of course I do. 
And I always knew it had happened, too. And that's why I hired you, Mr. Valentine, to catch him. Somewhere in Manitoba, Canada, I think, was the last place. You know, he sends me checks. You see, that's because he feels guilty about the way he treats me. Gary was a skin flint, a miser, a bloodsucker. I've sent descriptions. I've had detectives after him lots of times, but they've never been able hey, to catch him. Wait a minute, him. wait a minute, please, she, both of you. She's talking about her husband, George, her second well, husband. He only married me because of Uncle Harry's money, and I was the relative, but Uncle Harry was too smart for him. He'd never give him any. Oh, no, not him. Sophie, why do you... Bunker, his name is, and when you find him, you'll hang him, won't you, Mr. Valentine? I know Bunker did it. He always said he got Harry's money, and five years ago he did it, don't you see? And then he disappeared. Hold it, hold it, would you please? This Bunker, what happened? Was he a husband that ran away from you? <gasps> I beg your pardon? I sent him away, don't you understand? He was no good, and I sent him away. That's why I'm using my first husband's name. Bunker was a lying cheat, and he killed Uncle Harry, and I sent him away before I knew what he'd done. <laughs> well, get him, that's all. Get him and hang him. <laughs> And now, Valentine, will you listen to the voice of reason for a minute? Bunker ran away from Sophie in San Francisco, but it was two months before Uncle Harry disappeared. Oh. Sophie's just a little cracked on the subject, that's all. As I figure, Bunker's the one person probably didn't kill Uncle Harry. Forget him. What do you mean? Lonely area around here. Anything can happen. Nobody will be able to remember. Five years is a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I understand it all now. It isn't just the skeleton in her closet, is it? Nope. Yeah, Sophie wanted me to prove it was Uncle Harry so she could prove it was her no-good husband who did it. Instead, now we've got to solve a five-year-old crime that everybody else would have to have hushed up. Because everybody in the whole area is a suspect for murder. You know who'll get the last laugh? <laughs> Uncle Harry's bones. Now, tell me, how is that possible? For Uncle Harry to start laughing, that is. It isn't. Not unless all that's left of Harry is his funny bone, which is a nice, happy thought. However, in case it didn't hit you quite right, here's something that's not off the elbow. It seems your client, Sophie, is the only one who ever liked Uncle Harry. Everyone else, including the sheriff, would prefer to let sleeping dogs lie. And if your name is George Valentine, you know how hopeless it will be to try to solve a five-year-old crime when everyone in town is a suspect. Sheriff Harry was a miser, wasn't he? A hermit and a miser. What are you getting at? I don't know. Gold. Misers have gold, don't they? Of course they do. If they're smart, like Harry was. Well, sure, that's why he was killed, I guess. What do you mean? Well, most of his money was in property. But people always said he had a good many thousand dollars stashed away somewhere. Somewhere like where? Ooh, up around that place of his. I could never find any. And I'm the one who boarded the place up after he disappeared. I mean, Uncle Harry's place. You mean, you mean there's a house, a farm or something? It's a cabin. Nothing but a cabin. Well, come on, Brooksy. What are we waiting for? It's about a mile around the lake from here. I boarded her up solid in case he ever came back. George, what about Sophie? Never mind her. Now I know who smacked her. Not much of a cabin for a rich man, is it? No. Yeah. No. At least he kept it neat and clean. Turn your flashlight over here. Oh. Just a desk, that's all. You think there's any point in going through it? Not if you're looking for money. Listen. Oh, it's just the wind, I guess. Hey, wait, Brooksy. What? A brick out of the fireplace. Yeah, a nice little hole underneath. Hmm. Maybe Uncle Harry did have some money. Sure, of course he did. What's the matter? Hole in the mattress. 
place for a box. Hey, look on. Oh, I tripped. <laughs> well, there's nothing funny about it. Yes, there is. Loose board, ain't it? This place is honeycomb with old hiding spots. Yeah. All of them empty. Look. Look, here's a coin. This one wasn't empty. I mean, once upon a time. None of them were from the looks of it. I mean, that doesn't quite make sense, does it? What do you mean, George? You know, with the kind of tough old guy that Harry must have been. I don't... Duck, duck, Angel. What? Get down, get down. Turn off that flashlight. George. Take it easy now. This is who I think it is. The man with the shovel. I can see him in the doorway. Sure. All right, shut the door, Buster. There's a draft. Uh, Never mind the match. George, look out for the shovel! Get away from me! All right, I guess now we can have some light, Angel. Well, it's our neighbor. What's your name? Dorky, that right? Let go of me. Sure, sure, I'll let go. The man who warned us away, the man who said Sophie was the just The man who warned to... Sophie away, you mean? What? I did not. You got mad and hit her, too. That's assault. Now, look, listen to All me. All a matter of geography. I remember what she wrote me about the two roads. And Doc Sellers and Douglas went to town this morning. That's in the other direction from your place by the hill. So how did you know that Doc had gone to town? He wouldn't have gone past you. That's the wrong direction. So I guess you knew he was gone because you'd been over there. Sophie herself must have told you where he was. All right. Don't prove anything. No, but your shovel does. I wondered why a guy who'd committed murder five years ago would be stupid enough to commit an overt act today. Murder? Now, look, I hated Uncle Harry, I sure, but I... didn't say you did, did I? Relax, relax, Buster. You're just a little greedy, that's all. Come digging for the miser's cash. George, I don't understand. When people thought Uncle Harry disappeared, they'd naturally assume he took his loot with him. Now it seems he was murdered. That makes it a little different. Nobody alive would be smart enough to kill him and find all of it. An old cowhide skin flint like that. I know, I know. That's why you wanted Sophie to stop raising alarm. If everybody knew for sure Uncle Harry was dead, why, you'd get trampled in the rush up here. He built me out of some of my property. You can't blame me Buster, for what Buster, I'm he... not blaming you for anything. That's not my job. Now get out. Go on. Go home. George, what on earth... Come on, come on. You heard me. There isn't any gold around here. What's the matter, Angel? Don't you understand? We're all through with this case. Quiet, all of you, I'll throw you out. Go on, Doc. Oh, uh, sure, coroner. There's not much to say. I've given my testimony. He's identified the body. That's all we need from Doc Sellers. Well, Sheriff, who has got something to say? I understood this fellow Valentine had caught somebody up at Uncle Harry's shack. I know this isn't a court, but we sure want to hear everything that... I has... haven't got anything to add, coroner. Now, see here, Valentine. No, no, coroner. I'm all through with this case. Yeah, I'm on my way back to the city. Valentine, Valentine. Yeah, yeah, what was the idea back there at the, at the inquest? There's no idea, Doc. Well, see here, if you think our sheriff is capable... The sheriff's all right, Douglas. Yeah, big compliment. Hey, he only wishes it were true. All right, now listen, all of you. Uncle Harry was a heel. The whole town wished him dead. Sheriff, when the skeleton was found, your idea was to let sleeping dogs lie, huh? Not exactly, but holy smoke, we gotta live with the people you know. This place has been pretty nice for the past five years. Well, then? We'll take care of Dorky, all right. For but... assault, that's all, Sheriff. That's your business. Yeah, but now I got a murder to solve. You help get this rolling, you can't just walk all off. All right, and... all right. Keep your shirt on, Sheriff. You won't have to nail anybody in your town for murder. But you said that the... Well, mur- let's start at the beginning. Five years ago. Uncle Harry, the hermit, the miser, the boy with the gold. Somebody comes and tries to get his gold. Kills him, takes his gold. But you've been up to the cabin, Sheriff. How did the killer find all the loot? In at least three separate hiding spots. Well, he could have twisted the old boy's arm or dug around. Nothing was disturbed. He went right to the spots. Yeah, I remember. And if he got rough with Harry, would Harry have told him where all the spots were? Well, no. I see what you mean. No, you don't, Douglas. Maybe Sophie's an unhappy, bitter woman, but uh, she had the right idea. Sheriff sent some telegrams to, uh, where was it she got her last money order from? Someplace in Manitoba, Canada? Bunker, that, that no good husband of hers, he's the one. Bunker? Well, I grant you he could have come up here after he left Sophie in San Francisco. I guess nobody would have known if he was out at Harry's place. Yeah, but she's had detectives looking for Bunker, tracing those little, those little money orders he sent once in a while. Mm, that's right. 
They ain't been able to find him, Valentine. Okay, okay. But, Doc, you wouldn't be able to lie about x-rays of anybody who's still around here, would you? I mean, right out in public court and all? No, 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 you couldn't do that. You'd be caught up. What are you talking about? Perjury. I waited just long enough for you to commit perjury at the coroner's inquest, Doc. Well, what are you... What are you talking about? A tin box with a live spider in it. Spider? Yeah, that's what gave me the idea, and it's the only way to explain everything. Suppose the spider got in there when the box was open, say, a few days ago. By Doc alone. You're crazy. No more than your sister is. Suppose you switch some x-rays. We'll tie that together with what I said about Uncle Harry's hiding places. There's only one person who could have gone right to the hiding places. And that's Uncle Harry himself. No, now look. But he couldn't do that if he were dead, could he? All right, then. Suppose Doc here once treated a fracture for Bunker. Bunker? Yeah. Oh, boy, that would... Yeah, hey. simple as that. Five-year-old crime. Man killed another man, threw him in the lake. And now, because his sister would inherit some property and so on, Doc decides to make the skeleton into Uncle Harry, when it's really the skeleton of Bunker. That's not true. Now, Sheriff, you got to believe me. Perjury, I Doc. Perjury, remember? Uh. But, Sheriff, I think the reason detectives haven't been able to trace Bunker is pretty simple now, don't you? Wrong description. Just send a description to Canada of Uncle Harry. They'll get him all right. <laughs> and there you are, Sheriff. Instead of just a bunch of bones, Uncle Harry is a real live murderer. Uncle Harry? Well, I'll... Hey, Valentine, wait a minute. Where are you going? Back to the gal what brung me. Sophie. Yeah, there's a lot more important stuff to clear up in this case than dead skeletons. Yes, yeah, Sheriff, I got a live client to drag out of her closet. A gal who hired me and then slammed doors in my face. Why? Well, in a couple of seconds, I'll find out. You know, I'm kind of sorry for old Sophie. I've got a feeling that when George gets through with her, she'll be sorry the story wasn't called Aunt Sophie's Bones. But while we're waiting for the worst, let's give a listen to the best. He hated Harry. Bunker hated Harry. Sure, Sophie. He must have come here to get some money out of Harry, and, well, Harry defended himself, I guess. It's been sweet of Uncle Harry to send me the money orders all this time. Even if it is trapping you. Mm, I wouldn't be too sure it was sweet. It's kept the illusion that Bunker was still alive. He'd do that on purpose. Oh, yes. Perhaps. In fact, I wouldn't be too sure you love that uncle as much as you claim. I think you just hated Bunker. But now Bunker's dead. Now you know he's dead. People can waste a lot of time. Hating, can't they? Oh, Sophie, I'll tell you something. You wasted a lot of our time before I caught on why you hired me, then didn't want to talk. Well, I, I told you you were working. Well, I didn't think it was just Dorky's getting rough. It was the fact you began to remember whose leg had really been fractured, wasn't it? Well, I, I couldn't understand what the doc was up to. <laughs> I'm so glad it was only perjury. Makes me feel much better. He'd been willing to wait another two years. You might have had Uncle Harry declared legally dead and collected his property that way. Yeah, but Doc wouldn't wait, that's all. Too good an opportunity. <laughs> and the ironic part is, if it had worked, Uncle Harry couldn't have done anything about the inheritance slipping away from him. Not without admitting the whole story. Well, I can see why Doc was tempted, all right. Doc hated Harry. Such a waste of time. And you said that before. About hatred being a waste of time. I collect butterflies, you know. People say I have about as much brains as one. But anybody who wastes time is uh, crazy. Yeah, yeah, sure, butterflies, I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> He's stupid, isn't he? <laughs> Doesn't learn any lessons from seeing what happens from, from an unhappy marriage. Don't worry, Sophie, I'm the teacher. What? Hey, what is this? Come along, George. Time to say good night. Oh, now you haven't seen my butterfly collection. You come upstairs with me and I'll show you my real prizes. Well, you can hang Buster back in the closet now. It's all over. Oh, but before you do, be sure to tell it that uh, George Valentine was played by Robert Bailey and Virginia Gregg played Brooksy. 
The story was written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis, and Eddie Dunstetter dug up the music. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. The hair-raising adventures of Sam Spade, detective. Brought to you by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. It's me, Effie. Oh, Sam, I've been worried about you. Sid Weiss was just on the phone, and he says digging up a corpse without a permit is against the law. It's all right, Effie. I just dug him up to say hello and put him back again. Oh, Sam. I'll be down in a couple of minutes to dictate my report, sweetheart. If I get lost on the way, you'll find me in City Hospital, the psycho ward, third straight jacket from the left. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented each week by Wild Root Cream Oil, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that will put your hair back in place again, grooming it neatly, naturally, the way you want it. Fellows... If a girl can spend half an hour under a hot dryer in a beauty parlor to look her best for you, certainly you can spend half a minute sprucing up with Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic to look your best for her. That's all it takes, and Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, the way girls like to see it. Besides, it relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. There's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root Cream Oil. It contains lanolin. So get the big economy-sized bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. And now, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Date, August 2nd, 1946. To Mrs. Gregory Denov. Subject... Death of Dr. Denov. I was sitting in my office with nothing to think about except a horse named Corkscrew Jr. My secretary, Effie Perrine, came in and said there was someone outside. I didn't look up from the dope sheet, so she said it again. Someone outside, Sam. What's he look like? Um, blue double-breasted custom-made suit, kind of my tie, hand-tailored shirt, English shoes, hand-trimmed Van Dyke. Get me a blank check and send him in. Okay, Sam. Please come in. Mr. Spade will see you now, sir. Thank you. You are Mr. Spade, Sam Spade. What can I do for you? I'm Dr. Gregory Denov, a psychoanalyst. I I need your help. Lie down, doctor, and tell me all about it. <laughs> I, I see you might also be noted for your sense of humor as well as your discretion. Who told you I was discreet? A man named Nicolaitis. Well, you tell Nicolaitis, I think he's cute, too. What else does he say about me? That I can trust you with $10,000? Oh. Is this Mr. Nicolaitis one of your patients? No. No, he isn't. As a matter of fact, he... He's gotten possession of some private records of mine. Well, it, it's rather involved. Nicolaitis is shaking you down, and he picked me as the middleman. Is that it? This is not an ordinary case of blackmail. Blackmail is blackmail, even if you do it in technicolor. Well, as you may know, a psychoanalyst keeps a faithful transcript, a detailed record of everything a patient says during consultation, no matter how intimate or shocking... Yeah. This man, Nicolaitis, has managed to gain possession of a copy of one of these case histories. The patient is a very celebrated person, and should this material be divulged, it may have very serious consequences for both my patient and and for me. Doctor, your best bet's the San Francisco Police Department. No, no, that's out of the question. Then I'm afraid I can't help you. Why not? Nicolaitis said I'm a you... private detective. When I take on a client, I take on his troubles. My job is to protect him, not to stand by and see him milked. You want to hire me on that basis, I'll listen. Oh, I'm, I'm so tired. I must trust somebody. What can you do for me, Mr. Spade? Write me out a check for $1,000. Got a pen? Yeah. All right. You see, Nicolaitis figures that if I'm getting a cut, I'll have to keep my mouth shut. I'll spend it all the same. Here you are. Thanks. Now, uh, what was the last thing Nicolaitis told you? 
that he would pick up the $10,000 here and deliver to you this file in question. Can you reach him? Yes. Call him. Tell him you've seen me. Tell him I won't do that kind of business in my office. Tell him to come to your house. I'll be there. What if he refuses? He won't. Tell him I have the whole 10000 What time? How about in an hour? No, no, I'm sorry. We'll have to make it around three or... Oh, goodness, I'm late now. I, I really... That's a beautiful watch, Mr. Denham. Yes. Foreign? Uh, yes. May I see it? My watch? Why, really, Mr. Spade, I'm very late. I have so many things to do, and I have to be at the Majestic Theater well before the matinee starts at 2.30. Are you going to see me at 3 o'clock if you're going to the theater? Oh, I'm not going to stay for the performance. <laughs> Well, Mr. Spade, till three o'clock then. Oh, my office is in my apartment. The address is here on my card. It's the penthouse. Penthouse, huh? Okay, doctor, I'll come formal. I'll wear the top to my bathing suit. I left my office around 2.30 and started walking up Knob Hill. The Versailles Apartments, where Denov's place was, took up the whole 300 block, so I didn't have any trouble finding it. I stopped across the street for a minute to get my breath after the uphill climb, mopped my face, and started across. Just as I got to the middle of the street... The crowd was packed in so close around, I couldn't see who'd done the Brody, but I had a pretty good idea. The cops had the sidewalk roped off and guards posted at the building entrance. It took me maybe 20 minutes to elbow my way through and show my credentials. Sergeant Levine had the front door, so they let me in. Lieutenant Dundee of Homicide met me at the door of the penthouse. Hiya, Sam. What do you want? I want to see Dr. Denov. The doctor's dead. Dead? Yeah. He's my client. They can't do this to me. How? Hit a Brody out the window? What are you here for? To see his wife. Okay with you? Why not? She's inside. Thanks. <laughs> Mrs. Danoff, please. With all due respect for your grief, I must have the keys to the cabinet where Gregory kept his confidential files. You realize that he wished me to take charge of his patients and that I am responsible. All this police and so on. We must get those files out of here as soon as possible. <clears throat> yes? My name is Spade. I am Dr. Zoya. I was poor Dr. Denov's oldest friend. If there's anything I'd like to I see do... you, Mrs. Denov, alone. But you police have already asked her so many questions. You see, she's not in the... I'm not with the police. I'm a private detective. I was working for Dr. Denov. A private detective? He was in trouble, you see. You see, Dr. Zoya, the police won't believe me. Mm. Mr. Spade, you'll tell them. You are telling me he didn't commit suicide. Well, Mrs. Denov, I guess that takes care of everything here. It's clearly suicide. Oh, idiot, blind, stupid idiot. Suicide. Mm. My husband, he treated suicides. He would never... No, please, it will be all right, my dear. I'm sorry. She's hysterical. Yeah. If I had the time, I would... Tell them, tell them. Please, Mrs. Denov. The undertaker has been arranged for a burial at 7 o'clock, Beit Israel Cemetery. Now, please, the key to Gregory's file. Here, take it and go. Go ahead, all of you. Okay, well, we'll not call you later. No, me. I'm so sorry, gentlemen. This hysteria, a simple traumatic condition. If I only had the time. Who oh, can I turn to? Who will help me? You think it's pleasant? You think my husband would rest if they said I committed suicide? What shall I do? What shall I do? What shall I do? Oh, oh you... Dr. Zoya didn't have the time, neither have I. You think it's murder? Who do you think killed your husband? To name someone? That's a very serious charge, Mr. Speed. Goodbye, Mrs. Denhoff. Constance Brent. You mean Constance Brent, the actress? Yes. She was his last patient this morning. She had threatened to kill him before. How do you know? My husband said so. Do you? Well, he, he'd written it down on his notes on her case. Once before, she'd almost pushed him from that same window. How about your husband and Miss Brent? Oh, I knew she was falling in love with my husband. That always happens. They, they call it a transference. But in this your case... Your husband told me Miss Brent was acting in a play this afternoon over at the Majestic. Yes, Midsummer Night's Dream. But she was here. I know she was here. Miss Ray, the receptionist, was coming back from lunch when she heard voices arguing inside. And she was sure it was Miss Brent's voice. Show me the doctor's case history on Miss Brent. I can't. It's missing. 
As soon as it happened, I went to the files. I meant to show it to the police. Who could have taken it? Constance Brent was the last one in that room before he died. Yeah. When did you see Nicolaitis last? Nick who? Skip it. Uh, where can I reach you in case... For the next couple of hours, I'll be at the Majestic Theater. I want to see how good an actress this Constance Brent is. Constance Brent's dressing room? What do you want? I want to talk to Miss Brent. Well, you can talk to me. I'm her husband. So you're Mr. Brent. I'm Jonathan Wallace. She's Mrs. Wallace. Now, what do you want with my wife? I've come to tell her that Dr. Denhoff is dead. D- uh, are you sure? You try falling from a 12th floor window sometime. Well, that's the best news I've heard this year. I'm afraid it'll be a shock for Constance. Maybe, maybe not. She was the last person to see him alive, as far as anybody can make out. Uh, are you from the police? No, uh, I'm from the insurance company. Claims investigator. What do you want to see Constance for? The policy wasn't made out to her, was it? No, made out to his widow. But she can't collect. Police say it was suicide. Oh, that settles it. This is the last time I play Titania. Stand around while Puck talks his head off. Who is this person? Darling, I'm afraid this is going to be a shock. This man is from an insurance company. Dr. Denov is dead. Oh, what a pity. What happened? The police say he jumped. His wife says he was pushed. She also says that you, Miss Brent, might have been the pusher. Oh, now, really, it's too absurd. How like a wife. What time did your play start this afternoon, Miss Brent? Matinee at 2.30, always. Always. And the late lamented Dr. Denov jumped at 3 o'clock. I didn't say he did. Doesn't this news, uh, shock you? But of course. You think good psychoanalysts are easy to find? Looks like your next doctor will have to start from scratch. Your case history seems to be missing from Dr. Denob's files. Missing? No. Where is it? Has a man named Nicolaitis been in touch with you? I've never heard of him. Chances are you will. Does he have Dr. Denob's notes on my case? Could be. <gasps> this is frightful. Hot reading, huh? You seem to know this person, Nicolaitis. Get that file for me and I'll pay you well for it. Just a minute, my lovely Titania. We... We don't know who this man really is. He might even be Nicolaitis himself. Let me see your company credentials. Now, what do you know? Somebody picked my pocket. My wallet's gone. I thought so. All right, you tell me who you are. I'll call the police. Oh, no, no, Jonathan. No police. Let's get off the merry-go-round. My name is Spade. You'll find me in the phone book under S. My office is open until 6 o'clock. And if a man answers, don't hang up. It'll be me. You found a Nicolaitis yet? Not one. I even tried spelling it backwards. <sighs> Nobody ever heard of a man named Nicolaitis. I'm beginning to think there ain't no such person. Pardon me. Uh, do I hear my name mentioned? I'm Nicolaitis. Sam, I still think you're right. Come all the way in, Mr. Nicolaitis. Sit down. Oh, thank you. If you need me, Sam, just scream. What can I do for you? Oh, I've come for my money. What money? The $10,000, you remember the $10,000? Refresh my memory. Oh, Dr. Denhoff, the gentleman who visited you this morning? Oh, uh, that $10,000. Oh, you see, you see, you remember now. Yeah, yeah, it all comes back to me now. Uh, you were supposed to deliver something for the money. I think Dr. Denhoff is dead. That is no longer important. You will give me the money, please, and I will not disturb your afternoon any further. Suppose I refuse. Oh, that would grieve me. In my grief, there is no telling what I might do. Dr. Denhoff's dead. There's nothing more you can do to hurt him. Oh, never would I attempt to hurt poor Dr. Denhoff. But in my sorrow, it would be so great if I should be forced to hurt the woman he lost. After all, as Titania says, these are the forgeries of jealousy. Sonia, huh? Ah, yes, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, Act 1, Scene 18. (laughs) I'm a little rusty on my Shakespeare. Oh, you are indeed, Mr. Spade. Titania doesn't appear until well into Act 2. She doesn't, huh? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. I guess she isn't on for 40 minutes or so. Yes, indeed, Mr. Spade, but I didn't come here to discuss drama. What else have you got to discuss? When Dr. Dunhoff died, your market died with him. That is a very unprogressive view, Mr. Spade. There's always a gentleman named Jonathan Wall. Why, you fiend. You don't mean you'd sell to both of us. Mr. Spade, how can you have such a low opinion of me? I will prove my integrity. I will give you the material. You give me the money. Hand it over. In the Levant, Mr. Spade, we have a saying. He who goes too close to the bear soon loses his beard. I have left my beard at home. Okay, I'll meet you anywhere you say, anytime you say. Excellent. At seven in your apartment? Hmm? Won't that be walking into the bear's cave? In the Levant, Mr. Spade, we have a saying. Private dicks do not kill people in their own apartment. <laughs> It was then 6 p.m. I called Effie for messages. She told me that you had been phoning frantically, Mrs. Denov. I still had maybe 30 minutes before Nicolaitis was due at my apartment, so I breezed on up to your place on the hill. We had a very interesting chat, uh, remember, Mrs. Denov? Looking back on it, that was probably the most interesting conversation we had. Funny, I can't remember much of anything you said, but it was so uh, cozy there in your place. And what with your clock being about 20 minutes slow, it must have been something like half past seven before I left you. I grabbed a cab and told the hacky to step on it. I hoped Nicolaitis was still waiting at my apartment. He was. Mr. Nicolaitis, I'm sorry to be late. He was lying on my bathroom floor. The little guy was looking just about as natty as when he'd been in my office, except that the beautiful silk scarf he'd been wearing was twisted into a tight noose around his neck. Mr. Nicolaitis was a very dead blackmailer. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the fourth in a new series of programs bringing to the air for the first time... The Adventures of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Men at the racetrack, the man who has something better than a mere hunch is said to have it straight from the horse. Of course, that's a humorous expression. But it shows how to get facts. Go straight to the real source of information. And that's why we went straight to hundreds of men in metropolitan New York to find out what men really want in a hair tonic. And their answers show that Wild Root Cream Oil has all five advantages chosen by this impartial consumer jury of men. One, Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, never leaves it sticky or greasy. Two, Wild Root Cream Oil relieves annoying dryness. Three, it removes loose dandruff. Four, it's non-alcoholic. And five, it contains soothing lanolin. Remember, no other leading hair tonic gives you all five of these important advantages. Is it any wonder that four out of five users in a nationwide test preferred Wild Root Cream Oil to all other hair tonics they'd tried? So next time you visit your barber, ask for Wild Root Cream Oil and get the big economy-sized bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil at your drug or toilet goods counter. Back to Sam and Psyche. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. His eyes were open and he seemed to be looking right at me as I bent over him. The finger marks in his throat were too blotchy to be of any use. Pretty soon, Lieutenant Dundee and Sergeant Polehouse came in and walked over behind me. We all stood there for a second and then Polehouse bent down and closed those eyes. You know him, Sam? His name is Nicolaitis. That's all I know about him. What did he come here to your place for? I don't know. You invited him? I wouldn't have been surprised to find him here. But not like this. 
You boys got a smear on him yet? Sure. He's an old customer of mine. Runs a photo lab. Photostats, microfilm. Microfilm. Nobody makes any sense. They're all screwballs, psychos, neurotics. What am I doing in the middle of this anyway? Sam, don't scream at us. We're just doing a job. Oh, I'm sorry, boys. This Dr. Denov is my client. Mental and I was... expert. That Denov probably had a screw loose somewhere and needed a psychoanalyst himself. Say, maybe he was... Yeah. Yeah. Hey, look, Dundee. Hmm? I'm going out of here now. Do I call Sid Weiss and we go through all that again, or are you going to let me walk? Why, Sam, you can go. I know where you sleep. I'll wake you when I'm ready for you. Well, Mr. Speed? I want some answers, Dr. Zoya, and you're the guy who can give them to me. I'm listening. Just let the questions flow into your mind and do not try to repress any of them. Speak instantly, whatever... Okay, question number one, without thinking. Do you think Dr. Denhoff was a suicide? Well, I had not seen Dr. Denhoff for many years. He had been my student in Vienna. I was his analyst, in fact. That's all very interesting, Doctor, but my question... Yes, yes, sir. Did poor Dr. Denhoff commit suicide? I have reviewed all the material, manifest and hypothetical, and I came to the conclusion, no, no, it was quite impossible. You see, these paranoid... Okay, question number two. Was uh, Dr. Denhoff in love with Constance Brent? I suppose I can now answer that question. When I arrived in San Francisco, I found him in great distress. He told me he feared he was losing his objectivity... Towards this patient. In other words, he was in love with her? Yes. You think she might have murdered him? All psychoanalytical subjects develop aggressive feelings toward the doctor. (laughs) Nearly all of my patients have threatened me at one time or another. You don't say. Uh, Tell me, Dr. Zoe, you know anything about Jonathan Wallace, Miss Brent's husband? A violent type. Almost psychotic. Yeah? How about you, uh... Dr. Zoya, could you have done it? That is a most interesting question, Mr. Spade. When I arrived here from Vienna without funds, dependent on the kindness of my former students, I must confess that I felt a certain antagonism. It disturbed me to realize that a man of my standing in the profession should have be dependent on the goodwill of a younger and, uh, I sincerely believe, less gifted man. However, I overcame this, and I didn't kill him. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah, Doctor, thanks a lot. Oh, peep, peep. Uh, truly a life study. <laughs> there is no accounting. <laughs> For instance, Dr. Denhoff. He came to me only this afternoon with the strangest request. Yeah? He gave me the gold watch. The gold watch which I had presented to him many years ago upon his graduation in Vienna. He had a patient waiting and so had not much time to explain. Where is this watch? Please, I'm coming to that. He asked me to promise that I would have the watch buried with him if something should happen. That has been done. But Dr. Denhoff just died at three o'clock. It is a mosaic law that the deceased be buried before sundown. Uh Uh-huh. Thanks, Doctor. Thanks a lot. Hmm. I hope I've been of some help. Doctor, you'll never know how much you've helped me. Spade. Oh, what's happened? I think I got the answers, Mrs. Denhoff. That file on Constance Brent. Your husband knew that you'd been going through it. Oh, Mr. Spade. Shut up and listen to me. He took it out of the files, had it microfilmed for his own private records, and destroyed the original. Really? The man who did the microfilming was Nicolaitis. He delivered one print to your husband and kept another for himself. He was murdered in my apartment for the copy he used to shake down your husband. The killer now has that copy, if it hasn't already been destroyed. But we can still put our hands on the first strip of microfilm which you delivered to your husband. This is astonishing. How? It's in the gold watch which was buried with him. 
Oh, the, the watch that Dr. Zoya... That's right. Denov made up his mind that whatever he knew about Constance Brent was going to go to the grave with him. What are you doing tonight? Well, nothing. And we got a date, sweetheart, you and I. I'll be back toward the wee hours. All paths lead to the grave. Ophelia, Act 6. Gregory's grave? But shouldn't we get a court order and have it done properly? The courts don't open until 10 in the morning, sweetheart. And Lieutenant Dundee's going to start asking me some questions about that stiff in my apartment before then. You see, baby, I can't wait. We shouldn't be doing this. If I'm wrong this time, it won't be wasted effort. I'll crawl into the grave myself and pull it in after. Here. I struck it. Give me that crowbar, Mrs. Denov, quick. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Put that flashlight in, sweetheart. You look the other way. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. Look. What, Mr. Speed? What have you got? The watch. Here, put the flash on it while I open it. Uh, here's my nail file. Pry off the back. Thanks. That does it. Here's, here's, here's the film. All right, Mr. Spade. Give me that film. Who wasn't the second gravedigger from Hamlet, Mr. Constance Brent? Stop clowning and hand it up to me. You better do as he says, Mr. Spade. We both got guns. I was expecting that. Took you a long time to get here, Mr. Wallace. How did dear Constance make out as Lady Macbeth? Just give me that film. Stop being an idiot, Wallace. The cemetery is crawling with cops. Put that gun away before you drop it and break your foot. Come up out of that grave, Spade, or you'll stay there forever. Okay, Dundee. All right, all right. Get those hands up, everybody. Go ahead, Dundee. Make the pinch. Okay. Sam Spade, I arrest you for body snatching violation of graves under the civil code number... No, you fool. You're supposed to arrest Mrs. Gregory huh? Denov and Jonathan Wallace for the murder of Gregory Denov and Pericles Nicolaitis. But I... Oh, yeah, yeah, I... No, you don't! I... Oh, no! It was smart of you, Mrs. Denov, to make me late for my appointment with Nicolaitis. You did that so that Wallace could nail him in my apartment for the microfilm. You thought you could use that film to pin Denov's murder on Constance Brent. But after your late husband caught you tampering with his files, he added a few well-chosen words to it so that the film put the finger on you and your boyfriend, Mr. Wallace, in case anything happened to the doctor. So Wallace had to kill Nicolaitis. You weren't smart to push your husband out the window. That looked like suicide. You might have gotten away with it, Mrs. Denov, if you'd bashed your husband's head in with a bottle. Uh, that reminds me, Effie, pour me a drink that all? Sign it, put a special delivery on it, and send it care of the matron to Hatchapi Prison. Go on, have one yourself. Oh, thank you. Here's how. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get used to it. <laughs> Good night, Sam. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> Wild Root Cream Oil presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective produced and directed by William Spear. Men, on these warm August days, the sun beats down on your hair, may leave it looking dry and brittle. That's why, now especially, you need Wild Root Cream Oil. This grand non-alcoholic hair tonic has just what it takes for summer grooming. It contains lanolin, the soothing oil that's so much like the oil of your skin. Wild Root Cream Oil keeps your hair neatly in place, gives it the handsome, successful look that helps you get ahead on the job. And Wild Root Cream Oil removes loose, ugly dandruff and actually relieves annoying dryness. So tonight, take the famous FN test. Check your scalp. Signs of dryness or loose dandruff tell you, you need Wild Root Cream Oil right away. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Fred Essler was Dr. Zoya. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Don't forget, next Friday, the three masters of the art of hair-raising, Dashiell Hammett, William Spear, and Wild Root Cream Oil, join forces to bring you another hair-raising adventure with Sam Spade. Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, for quick, good grooming and to relieve dryness between permanents. Mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Personal notice, dangers my stock and trade. 
If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Greetings, friend. Time again for Let George Do It. Oh, which reminds me. How would you like to sit in on a nice little card game? I happen to know four charming fellows who are just dying for a fifth. On the other hand, though, maybe you'd better forget about it, because these boys would not only take your bankroll, they'd just as soon take your life. But it's a pretty good game at that. So while we're waiting for George Valentine to show... Let's take a look in on this happy foursome. Well, it's ten o'clock already, gentlemen. Shouldn't we... (laughs) I mean, my watch says ten. Chester has the cards and... Sure, what are we waiting for? We're going to do it, let's get... No! No. Ames, Salto, this is crazy. It's insane. It was your idea, wasn't it, Norton? Yes, but a man's guilt is no more to be bandied about. Oh, get off the words. There's the good name of the man to be thought of afterwards. Let's get it over with now. Now! All right. Need a piece of paper. Envelope here in your jacket. Do you mind? Of course I do, if it's got my name on it. Valentine. George Valentine. What? Oh, your wife's letter from somebody named Valentine. Yeah. If I'd know her friends. Here, here's a blank sheet. Club stationery. Uh, couldn't we get on with the... Dear Mrs. Ames, I am so sorry to hear of your concern over your husband. Naturally, I will do whatever I can to help. Sincerely, George Valentine. You mean that? Right. <laughs> concern. How do you like... For heaven's sake, stop the stalling, both of you. Will you get... All right. St- I draw one. Go on, draw a card. Me? Go on, Salto. All right. Nine of diamonds. Yeah. Norton? (laughs) Nine of clubs. Nine again? Give me one of those. Jack. Diamonds. All right, Chester. Chester. Huh? Your turn. Draw. Oh, I, I'm all right. Draw. Oh, yes. King. <laughs> king of hearts. Look, Chester drew the king of hearts. Shut up. You understand, Chester. High card. Yes. Yes, the paper. Here, here. You can use the pen there. Uh, I'm all right. <clears throat> I, Jeffrey Chester, hereby confess one year ago to this date, it was I who murdered Miss Dorothy Fullman. It is after ten o'clock now, Chester. I'd like to have a drink or two. I'll I'll have to run down to my boarding house. There's a bill I should pay. Uh, The watchman's spare gun is in the locker room, and it would look better if you did it at the same place that... Leave him alone, Salto. I'm all right. I could run downtown first, then come back, have the drinks, if I could borrow your car, Mr. Ames. Sure, Chester. Let's go over and get you my car. Sure. Thank you. You can mail my confession of guilt to the police. I got the high card. I'll be dead by midnight. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to George Valentine, and let George do it. Where are you, Sylvia? 
It's a big idea, that letter in my coat pocket. Miss Valentine, who is he? Honey? Oh, there you are. So sorry to hear of your concern over your husband. Victor, of all the meddling... Please. Hello? This huh? is Mr. Valentine. Miss Brooks, my husband, Mr. Ames. Oh. How, how do you do, Mr. Ames? Huh. My foot in my mouth. Just who are you? Did you have a nice time, darling? Where have you been? Huh? Oh, over to the club. Yeah, they let me in. Just playing a little cards, that's all. Look, Mr. Rames, I had a letter from your wife. My wife I'm is leaving me. me. What difference does it make? Go on, get out. She's hired snoopers before, my friend. What? You can't. Oh, shut up. Listen to me. You were beaten up the other night. Get them out of here. Get yourself out of oh, here. Sh- oh, no, you Stop it. No, listen. What's the matter with you, friend? Victor, that was your car, wasn't it? Driving away? Yes. Yes, I loaned it. To somebody needs it for a while tonight. He's got some things to do. Mr. Rames, I know I'm butting in, but your wife has been worried. And Please. I'm, here. I'm going back over to the club. There's nothing anybody can do now except to make things worse. What? <laughs> Darling! Send him home, Sylvia. I'll take care of myself. <sighs> I put your letter in his pocket on purpose, Mr. Valentine. He'll never listen to me or believe me. It was certainly an understatement when you said he was upset. Yes. But you haven't said why yet. Now, just what's going on tonight, Mrs. Ames? Where's your husband really been? I don't know. Playing cards, I guess. He doesn't generally, but no harm could come out of that, could it? Maybe not. You said he'd been beaten up. Oh, yes, I know he's in danger. Go on, go on. Your husband's a lawyer, isn't he? He was until a year ago. His practice disappeared on him. What do you mean? Suspicion, distrust, whispers. This is a small town, Mr. Valentine. A very nice town. My husband used to be a very nice person. What happened? Have you ever heard of the Dorothy Fullman murder case? Well, yes, yes, I think so, only I don't remember the It was never solved. She was murdered, beaten up. It was horrible. They never even found the weapon. Police, experts, everyone's been over it a million times. It was a whole year ago. They'll never get a confession from anyone. Mrs. Ames, was your husband... My husband was very nearly tried for that murder. Oh, I see. But then if he weren't tried, then... There are uh... people in this town who believe, who really believe that he killed her. Who will always believe it. There wasn't any actual evidence. But the circumstances. Horrible, sordid, awful. Mrs. Ames, just tell me one thing, will you? Do, uh, do you think your husband killed this Dorothy Fullman? Mr. Valentine, I, I don't want anything worse to happen. I. That's all. <laughs> I say, excuse me. Mm. You're Mr. Valentine, aren't you? George Valentine? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was looking for the club doorman. My name is Norton. This is quite a pleasure. I've heard of you. Seen your name here and there? Oh, is that so? Uh, See, here. Uh, Join me on the veranda for a cup of coffee, will you? Hospitality of our little club isn't I'm sorry, Mr. Norton. I'm looking for a man named Ames. Oh, yes. Victor Ames, splendid chap. Haven't seen him in some time. Might be here later... Uh, We can wait together. I said I'm sorry, Mr. Norton. (laughs) Well, I certainly don't intend to be pushy. Oh, wait a moment. Uh, Perhaps I should be a bit more honest and say there's a little matter I'd like your advice on. I'd still go looking for Mr. Rames. Even if I said the little matter concerned Mr. Rames? (laughs) You twist my arm. (laughs) Then we can do better than the veranda, I think. People there. There's a lounge in the locker room. All right. Through here? Uh, to your left. Generally closed at night, but uh, there we are. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, what's the story? <sighs> Nothing so very important, but uh, sit down, sit down. How'd you know who I was out there? Well, Ames had mentioned your coming. You said you haven't seen him lately. Try again. <sighs> really, Mr. Valentine, I... Sh- 
Hey, who's that? Hey, anybody in here? Locking up. Blue shirt. Private police? Oh, just a moment. Yes, yes, he is. Uh, Mr. Valentine, let go of me. Well, what are you doing here? Ah, what do you mean? Stop it. Who are you? Hey, hey, what is it? Jimmy, Jimmy, I, I found this man. Break it up, break it up. Break uh, what up, John? I found him in here. I, I left my wallet in, in wallet, my locker. All, the... all you... right, all right. Oh, it's you, Mr. Norton. He was snooping, Jimmy. Now my wallet's gone. He took it. He must have it. Oh, brother. If what this am is... I supposed to do? Search him. Oh, but he won't have it, will he? Uh, that, that's not the way they work. Uh, but uh, he's trespassing. You can lock him up for that. I'll see the steward for fair charges. I'm sorry, Mr. Norton. What? I said I'm sorry. You're not going to prefer anything. Good night. Jimmy, my father was the founder of this club. When I issue an order to one of the paid employees, I expect yeah, that... Yeah, 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 sure, sure, issue away. Only someplace else, huh? I'll handle this end. Good night, Mr. Norton. Jimmy, I have never in my life been so... Good night. Yes, good night. <laughs> well, that was something. Okay, bud, hand it over. What? Oh, now, wait a minute. You don't mean you believe that old school ties gag about... And still you put him out? The wallet, bud. Oh, sure. Mine. Here. Credentials. The works. But enough. Oh. Well, I didn't exactly figure. Valentine, eh? Yeah, that's right. Only look, Buster. Why? Why'd you treat him like that? Will him like lettuce before you even know what he had because to say? Because I have no use for the high and mighty Mr. Norton. And don't worry, I won't get in trouble either. <laughs> he maybe don't know it, but he's being eased out the side door of this club anyway. All four of them are. All four? Will you clear that up? You ever hear the Dorothy Fullman murder? Well, that nice, dignified man there, that Norton. For my money, he's the one that killed her. All right, so you've got your opinions, Jimmy. It's just an opinion. I'll stick to it, Mr. Valentine. But there wasn't any concrete evidence against either him or Victor Ames. And what did you mean, all four of them? And why did Norton want to stall me like that? That's all he was trying to do, keep me away from something. You're the detective, mister. Uh, oh, hey, excuse me. Huh? <laughs> Hello, Mr. Chester. Oh, Jimmy, just standing here having a couple of drinks. I, I was downtown. Yes, that's done. Looks like you've had enough. Oh, no, no, no. I'm all right. I'm fine. I'm all right. Sure, sure, Mr. Chester. See him? Hmm. Oh, that guy? He's one of them. Say it faster, will you? One of the four. Dorothy Fullman was murdered in her house just over the bluffs across the golf course. Yeah. And never got enough evidence. They never will. But the police did prove that it couldn't be anybody else. It had to be one of the four men mixed up with it. Who are they? Mr. Norton. Ames, big fool, always in trouble. Another man named Salto. He asked me he couldn't have got to first base with it. And Chester there. Oh, I get it. Not much left of Chester, is there? All of them have changed. But he don't even know what he's doing anymore. Hmm. Nobody will confess, no evidence. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy, come here. Now, excuse me, steward, back to business. No, no, I'm right behind you. Huh? That's Victor Raines with him, isn't it? With the steward? Sure it is. Valentine. Yeah, we catch up again, friend. It's a busy night. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen. Uh, Jimmy, there's trouble in here. What? The card room, the one with the back entrance. I put those cards in there myself just this evening. Valentine, I've got to see oh, you alone. Hold it, will you? Go on, steward. Uh, this deck of cards. Uh, some men have been playing in there, apparently, or... Drawing high man or something. Well, what is it? What's the matter? Well, sir, it's more puzzling than anything else. At a club like this, someone was being dishonest. A rather hasty job, but here you see, this deck has been marked. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. And now back to George Valentine. Nine of Diamonds. Nine of clubs. 
Jack, diamonds. Your turn, Chester. Draw. Yes, I'm king of hearts. I hereby confess one year ago it was I who murdered Miss Dorothy Fullman. I got the high card. I'll be dead by midnight. Only if your name is George Valentine, all you know is the Dorothy Fullman murder case has never been solved. That there were four suspects, but the police have despaired of ever finding out who her murderer was. Yes, all you know is that Mrs. Ames was worried about the strange behavior of her husband, and more recently that four men have been playing cards in the back card room of the local club, and that the steward says the deck of cards is marked. No! No, they can't be. Give me Hey, those. hey, take it easy, Mr. Ames. Let's see, Stuart. They're not marked. What's bothering you so much, Mr. Ames? Kind of a crude job. Yes, Jimmy, a little ticks on the edges, like this. But the person who did it could tell the cards, all right. Get out of here, both of you, Jimmy Stewart. Hey, hey, slow down, Buster. Look, I've got to see you, Valentine. I've got to see you alone. Have you been sampling some of that stuff Chester uses, Mr. Ames? What's so important about Chester? Chester. Uh, hey, uh, where are you going, Miss Ames? He was downtown. He's back now. Oh, Buster, will the you please? He's here in the bar. He's having those last two drinks. Well, there you are. Oh, hello, Angel. Oh, Mr. Ames, I saw your wife to the station. She said to tell you... Yes, yes, uh, of course. Where is he? What? The little guy, Brooks. He was in here a few minutes ago. He was having a couple of drinks. Yeah, he's gone now. Well, I did see somebody leaving just when I came in. He looked like he could use a little sleep. It's five minutes to twelve. Time for you to clear it up, friend. Where's Chester gone? What's happening tonight? Could have been any one of us. I mean, the cards marking them. But I didn't try to save my own skin. I would have gone through it if I'd been high, man. What on earth? I'm trying to remember. The watchman's spare gun, that was it. Quit pulling, Buster. What? Yeah, the closet, the back hall. Come on, hurry, will you? The watchman's gun, that was it. Only the cupboard was bare. He's taken it already. Chester. There's certainly no gun in here. We drew. I man. He had the king of hearts. Little Chester, the weakest one in the whole bunch. Didn't even seem to react. What do you look? With I, you? I, I know I'm talking wildly. I'll explain later. We've got to find him first. Hurry. Oh, we're with you, all right. But who is he going to use this gun on? Who is he? Oh. Isn't it perfectly obvious, Mr. Valentine? On himself. <laughs> Just like Jimmy said, house over by the bluffs across the golf course. It's certainly deserted looking for sale, for lease. Chester must be here. It's where he'd come. It's Dorothy Fullman's house, huh? Where she was killed? Yes, in the living room. Found her body there. Beaten to death. Doors open, you see. Chester? Chester! Well, he's not here. The fall guy. Well, we're a long way on the outside of that old crime now, aren't we? Perhaps we beat him here, missed him in the dark... Chester! What do you mean, George? Ames here knows what I mean. This is where it happened. It wasn't a pleasant crime. And inside a man, a terrible thing like that can get bigger in a year, huh? Mr. Valentine, I didn't kill her. Sure, sure, that's what they all say. But Buster, I'm just finally beginning to realize what a hopeless, crazy thing is happening tonight. Wait a minute, George, listen. Upstairs. Come on. Chester? Where are you, Chester? It's me, Victor Ames! Salto. Salto, what are you doing here? Mr. Valentine's all right, Salto. He knows the whole story now. But I didn't mark any cards. It wasn't me. Then what are you doing here, Salto? Hiding. Leave him alone, Ames. Leave him alone. And never mind who marked the cards. But what do you think, Brooksy? Four men actually drawing to see which one would be a fall guy. Which one would confess to a murder? I don't believe it. Oh, yes, it's very easy for the two of you to talk like that. I told them it was ridiculous. Same as Russian roulette. Spin the cartridge wheel. See who gets the bullet. Yeah, they couldn't stand to be pointed at. The suspicion, the shadow of guilt. The crime that would never be solved otherwise. Yes, I told them that, but Ames and Norton kept you saying... You were willing that. enough, Salter. You didn't have any solution anyway to keep yourself from going insane. Maybe you can't believe it, Miss Brooks. Why should you? You don't have a private hell to live in. 
I don't think that's exactly what she meant, Ames. Sure, I know it's not like in books where people just forget about murder. But to try to dig yourself out of a swamp by drawing, taking one chance in four of being tapped for guilt, just to lay all the ghosts for the others. If we did it, so what? We did it. We've nearly killed each other trying to make each other confess anyway. I was thinking about the second part of the bargain. Suicide for the elected guilty one. Yeah, to make sure the police would accept that confession. Mr. Ames, you might have gone through with it. You're that kind. But I just don't believe that most men Check, would... Angel. All right, how about it, Soto? That's why you're here, isn't it? To see if Chester would go through with something that you wouldn't do yourself. That I... I'm sorry, Victor. I wouldn't have. I couldn't have. I went along with it. Of course I did. If I'd been high card, I don't know what I would have done, but... Okay, there's one down. Wet feet. By this time, Chester must be aboard the nearest freight train headed for parts unknown. Chester? He signed the confession. But he wouldn't do it. I know he'd been At drinking, the last but... moment, it's a little hard to pull the trigger. Is that so? You're so sure, aren't you? Huh? Moonlight out there. Window, come in. Look. It's him. It's Chester. But he's not coming toward the house. Just walking. That's the path runs up by the bluffs. Yes, and if anything happens to him, it's our fault, Salto. Come on, step on it. Run! Chester! Chester! What's the matter with him? He doesn't even listen. Oh, look out, George. Yeah, these bluffs are pretty steep, aren't they? Chester! I'm going to climb up this way, too. Oh, no, you don't, Buster. Huh? You what? just stay behind me with Miss Brooks. Valentine. There's another way this whole thing tonight can work, but I'm going to see that it does. George, look, he's up on one of the edges. Yeah. Stand still. Oh, what a... Norton. Get out of here. Leave him alone. Norton, wouldn't you know? Stand still. I'm warning you, I have a gun. Oh, yeah, sure. The one from the watchman's locker? He didn't take it. Chester didn't take hey, it. Hey, what's all this? So you did. Sure, sure. You guys wouldn't just make a deal for somebody to commit suicide. You'd get him to write a confession and then murder him. He killed her. He killed all the one. He confessed. Uh, George, he's up on the edge. Look at him. Leave him alone. He'll jump, I tell you. Look at the way he's acting. I just followed him. To give him the gun he didn't take. James, listen to me. It will all be over. For all of us. Are you inhuman? Oh, let it happen. If you don't, it'll be the same thing over and over George! and over again. Yeah, look. We can't stop him from here. And he does look like he wants to jump. Okay, so I've been wrong, so I... Valentine! Get out of the way with that gun! Okay, now you're all right. Got Martin, stay there, all of you. Chester! Mr. Chester! I'm all right. Uh, yes? Mr. Chester, now you listen to me. I can't reach you, but... Uh, but get away now. There's something I'm going to do. Yeah, I know, I know. Kill yourself. But you were supposed to do it where she died, weren't you? Wasn't that the agreement, Chester, to make it look good? Can you understand me, Mr. Chester? Oh, I'm all right. That's it, that's it. Just keep looking at me. It should have been the living room, though. Or were they always wrong? She was beaten, bruised. I remember they said they never found a weapon. Was it really up here that she died? Was she thrown? It would have looked the same if somebody then carried her body back to her house. I, I'm going to jump, you know. Get back, get back. No, you're not. You're too curious, Chester. This year, since Dorothy Fullman died, must have been the worst for the one who really killed her. Don't you think so, Mr. Chester? What? What do you mean? But admitting it is worse. Some people can't ever do that. They'd rather die than do that. I'm going to jump. You can't stop me. But you don't even want your death to be a confession, do you? Well, they gave you a chance, the little card drawing. You know the masked deck, the marked one, would be found sooner or later. You deliberately left it behind. No, no, no. Go away. The no. world would say your confession was a fraud. You are a poor little patsy. Well, any of them could have marked the cards, Norton, Salto, and... The high man marked them. The guilty man, Chester. All I've said is built on that. When there's a drawing, a man can't make another man take a certain card. So if he marks them, he only marks them for himself. Check? Yes, yes, I understand, but... To pick his own card. But the lowest card picked tonight was a nine. If a man wanted a low card, that's not very safe, is it, with 52 cards in a deck? You know, it baffled me for a while. Until I saw that you really did want to die. She was faithless. She was bad. Get out of my way! Oh, no, you don't... Now, just hang on. You're going to live, Buster. 
You're going to write a real confession. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. George, it did work out that way, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, Brooksy, they pieced it together again. That's why Chester went up to the bluffs instead of taking the gun. That's how he had killed Dorothy Fullman a year back. And if the first confession had gone through, if he'd shot himself, nobody ever would have believed it. Well, the other three would have always thought they railroaded the poor little punchy. Trade their private little hells for new ones. If Mrs. Ames weren't still in love with her husband and called you here. Mm-hmm. George, isn't it uh, remarkable what a woman will do for the man she loves? Remarkable. Forgive, forget, protect. I'll remember that. Darling. <laughs> the very next time I'm suspected of murder. Oh! Good night, Brooksy. <laughs> You have just heard High Card, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. You know, for the last two days, I've been beating my typewriter trying to think of a way to let you in on our adventure without spoiling the plot. But after using up several reams of paper, I find that it just isn't possible. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to tell you a thing, except that this is Let George Do It. And if you like to root for the underdog, you better start pulling for old George. Dear Mr. Valentine, that ad of yours gets me. No job too tough for you to handle. <laughs> well, I don't believe it. I got a tiger I'll bet you can't handle. Yeah, you read it right, a tiger. So unless you're just whistling in the wind, stick around your office tonight. Meet me around 7.30. I got a wife and kids to worry about, so don't fail me. Signed, Jerry Briskin. Signed, Jerry Briskin. 7.30. No, around 7.30. Uh-huh. How many stripes on a tiger? 40, George. He's only 40 minutes late. That's not so bad. Probably hired Frank Buck instead. We make a lot of sense, too, don't we? Huh? Want to play gin rummy? Oh, why is it, Brooksy? We never get letters that tell anything. He's got a case. Why doesn't he say so? Change his mind, maybe. Who knows? Jerry Briskin. Want to bet he never even shows up tonight? Um, $5. I'll bet $5. Give me that phone. Hello? Valentine, is Briskin. You're late. I just want to make sure you're still in the office. I got held up. Couldn't get any of your building because of the crowds. Slow down, will you? What What crowds? Hey, look, just sit tight, will you? I'll be right there. Honest, I will. Sure, sure. Bring your tiger, too. But what's this oh, about... Oh, just a crowd. I don't know. Something going on. Police and everything. But I'll come around the back way. Hey, look, Briskin, you... Well, you owe me five dollars, don't you? Not yet, I don't. What are you going to do? Jump out the window to avoid paying me? Oh, George, what's going on? I don't know. 
street seems to be roped off down there. There are no fire engines. Yes, or... there is. One small one. See it? Yeah. And they got a searchlight pointed at the top. What in the name of... Booksy, Booksy, look. Around there to the right. It's a woman on the ledge. She's the one who screamed, George. That's not all she's doing. Hey, look at the way she wobbles. They've got her in the searchlight. She's gonna... Here, maybe she can hear us from here. Hey. Hey, lady. Still 10 or 15 feet away. Lady, can you hear me? I'm over here. Hey, look, this way, will you... Oh, did George, she sees you. She stopped moving. Shh. Yeah, hello there. Now, look, uh, keep your eyes on me, lady. Don't mind all that noise down there. Now, keep your eyes on me and just keep moving toward me. No. It's all right, it's all right. The ledge is wide enough for you to get here. No, no, no. George, she wants to jump. She wants to kill herself. Look, look, lady. Nothing can be as bad as this cold wind up here. Now, come on. Easy does it. Don't come near me. Oh, George, what can we do? I'm all right. I'm fine. I'm not scared. Oh, brother, Looney is a coot. Oh, listen, people are coming out in the hall. Yeah, and it's liable to scare her, too. What are you talking about? I've walked all the way around the building. Do you know that? I bet you would be afraid to do that, wouldn't you? No. No, I don't think so. George, what are you doing? Get back in here. I don't get dizzy very easy. But I'm probably not as clever as you are. Oh, George, please. Are you coming to walk with me? Yeah. Yeah, sure, that's it. A little stroll in the park. I've never been dizzy. There's nothing to this, see? Look out, lady. Don't have to hold me. My, you're good looking too, aren't you? Only, only... Now, it's all right, lady. Those are just firemen to the rescue in my office, that's all. Come on now. Easy does it. Yes. Just another step. Only I feel so... Hey, look. I, I, I got you. Oh, lady, what a time to faint. Hurry up, George. Here, I, I can help you. I got her all right. That's it, boys. Get it. Get that picture. Photographers. Hey, clear out of here, you guys. This right, is no hold time to... a little higher, will you? That's it. Ah. Where have I heard your voice before? Come on, Buster, give me a hand. My with name this. is Briskin here. Now remember, boys, when you write captions, call her the Tigers of the Trapeze, world's greatest aerialist. World's great. Hey, what in the name of I heaven? I told you I wasn't scared. Were you, darling? Ah. No, no, don't drop me. Hold me tighter. That's it. <laughs> the lady fainted. Publicity. <laughs> so that's it. Why, you that's dirty... It, that's it. Get it, boys. Get him to get the expression on his face. Ah, wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> and thank you, Phyllis Fosdick. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to George Valentine and our Let George Do It adventure. Oh, now let me go, Valentine. Let go, I said. She got plenty of money. Hundred ain't enough for you. Okay, we'll make it two. It's worth it. Press agent, five thousand bucks couldn't stop me Look, from stop doing. Stop it! I said I got a wife and kids. Oh, you shut up! It's a job. That's all. I got rid of them all, George. She went down to buy all the photographers a drink. Oh, she did. Bully for her. Now, look, Valentine, you can't sue her. You just get laughed at. Buster, for two okay, cents. Okay, okay. So you look a little silly in a few front pages. It's publicity, ain't it? And for you too. She's pulled that stunt in every city she's played. You mean you pick a sucker in every no, town? No, no, and then... no. They walk around the building, it's all. You were something extra. Oh, come on. How could I resist that silly ad of yours? <laughs> hey, how about the faint she pulled, huh? Oh, I tell you, she's a great little artist. Briskin, that silly face of yours. All right, is about all right. To be... Pay you two fifty. Will you cut it out? Ah. Wow. Brooksy, I thought you said you got rid of everybody. I am here. Yeah. But I wait. Well, let me go. Go on, friend. Beat it. I wait to see you. You hold her. Huh? I follow. I am here. I see everything. Who are you? A man going crazy. Beat it, you big moose. The party's over. Go on, get out of hold here. It, get hold lost. Hold, hold, hold it. Uh, hello. Your name's Fedor, isn't it? Yeah. Leave us alone. I see how this man hold her. What in the name of heaven? Wait a Fedor's a husband, I think. Third or fourth, and it's living fast. Wow, well, wow, well, well, husband. Another tiger, I suppose. Well, uh, look, Fedor, just shut the door quietly and don't get your tail pinched as you leave. George! Mm. Oh, yeah. 
upset about something, aren't you, Fedor? I traveled 200 miles to get here. Who are you? You said that before. Never mind who I... Ah, jealous. Is that it? Didn't like the way I held it. I can see. I have heard the talk. Who are you? It was you? his idea, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. This guy, this, this uh, Jerry Briskin. He and your wife are just like that. Who? <laughs> Probably her lover, for all I know. So long, everybody. No, wait, wait. Fido, I'm very pleased to meet you. I mean, well, I, I got a wife and kids, you understand? I'm your wife's no press agent, that's all. Keep talking, sucker. I do not understand. Neither do I, big man, but then I only met your wife tonight when he brought her here. So, you you know how these things are. Talk it over with him. Uh, him? But it's... Time, right. time, time. This guy had an accident once. Uh, uh, Fedor, my name is Briskin, our new press agent. That's uh, all I... Look out! Uh, oh! uh, George, hey, stop! Hey, hey, cut it out. Wait a minute. You. Cut it out, you guys. Uh, you crazy fake bad fool. Uh, What's the idea? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Leave me alone. Leave you alone? What about me? He's the one. You said he's the one. He and my wife. Oh, well, it wasn't true. He just made it up. I don't know anything about your wife or about this guy who deserved to get kicked around a little, so who cares? Or for that matter, about any of this cockeyed business. I am sorry, I said. I am so tired. I travel all day. I make full of myself, yeah? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, uh, good night. Valentine Fate is her husband, Estella's husband. That's her name, Estella. Only had an accident a couple of months ago. This is I understand it. Yeah. I am strongest man in circus. Uh-huh. Only you got dropped on the head. Oh, be careful, George. Look, he's been in a hospital. Hasn't been with the circus. Look, look, look. I don't care who's been where. Now, get out. Get out, both of you. Please. Please, uh... I love her. She's my wife. All right, sure, that's great, that's fine. Every man to his own mistake. On the telephone, she says she's too busy to see me. She's my wife. Well, take it up with Dorothy Dix. And now you say that Fado, this Fado, man... we've been through that. He told you it wasn't true. It's not me, I'm a press agent, not her partner. Her partner? So? Oh, now look, both of you, Be will quiet. you please? She work with partner now. Is that true? There is partner. Look, will you just leave me out of it, Fedor? I work for a living. No, tell me. Get your hands off him. What do I have to do? Point a gun at you two to get you out of here? Okay, Valentine, we'll leave. I'll go first. No. No, not yet. Okay, if you guys think I'm kidding. No, 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 please. You, you, you don't have to threaten. I'm sorry. <laughs> It is lonely in hospital. I, I'm all confused. I need help. The man's bored with your story, Fader. So long, Valentina. I'll send you a check in the morning. Wait, I say. Mr. Valentine, you don't have to get behind your desk like that. I don't, huh? I don't know what to do, but it would be... Easier with gun. Oh, watch him, watch him. Hey, hey, get away. Gun. Right off, cut it out, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Easier with gun. Yeah. Thank you. Goodbye. Put that gun back here before I... Holy, holy smoke. There is a lover, you know, and fate has got your gun. Now look what you started. Look what I started. What did you say? Well, somebody's liable to get murdered. Well, brother, I should have finished this part of it earlier, shouldn't I? <laughs> All right, Brooksy, don't look at me like that. First a sucker, then a sourpuss. I know, I know. I just don't like being thrown into the middle of a three-ring circus, that's all. Not with all the animals running loose. are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. A 
press agent named Jerry Briskin gets you mixed up with a woman named Estella, tigress of the trapeze, world's greatest aerialist. Yes, if you happen to be George Valentine, and sometimes you wish you weren't, you're picked for a sucker in a publicity stunt. The only trouble is you can't get out of it because the tigress has a mate, and he has your gun. Well, it isn't the price of a gun that bothers you. It's the thought that you may never get it back because sooner or later it may be tied up as Exhibit A in a murder case. And so you decide you'd better find out about the corpse elect. Who it might be, for instance. All right, this way, ladies and gents. See the girly girly show. A point, all right. Ask Estella herself. She'll tell you who her boyfriend is. Today's boyfriend. Quite a man-eating tiger, that girl. She's doing her act over in the main tent, huh? Yeah, great performer, lady. Great. What's the name of this part? Uh, Estella, she's got nerves like iron. <laughs> a picture of her walking around the outside of a building in the newspaper. You see that? Matter, Mike, he got nausea or something? It makes him dizzy just to think about it. Just tell us where we can find this partner of hers. Well, he's busy catching her naturally. That's the act. That's always been all right. Three flips and she lands in his arms. A lucky stiff king for a day. Hey, right this way, gent. See him shimmy and shake. His name's Ferelli. Flying Ferelli. <laughs> Flying Ferelli? Bah, couldn't fly a kite. Sixty dollar a week bum, but big and good looking. All her assistants have been bums. She's the act, top number in the business. But I could tell you a lot better if I could look in your tea leaves. Oh, you're doing fine, thanks. Circus must be a small world. There's something in store for you, dearie. What could it be? Just give me a chance to read your... Well, ain't that pretty? Yeah, lettuce leaf, nice and green. And so easy to read, too. Mister, Theodore, he was one of her assistants once. Big, stupid thing. Always jealous like that. But a bark don't mean a bite. Her husbands don't last long, huh? Well, nothing happens to them, if that's what you mean. Fedor's the only one got dropped on his head. Yeah, and about that time, she was getting sick of my bet. George, what are you driving at? Oh, it was an accident to Fedor, all right. You don't catch me gossiping about my dearest friends. No, I'm sure. You, uh, worried about something happening? Why don't you wait outside the big tent for Stella herself? Or go over there in that palace she calls a dressing trailer. I can tell from the music she'll be on in a minute. I'm not that worried, thanks. Oh, uh, don't want to get uh, mixed up yourself, huh? <laughs> uh, she won't even see Fedor now. All through with him. So he won't come out here hanging around too close. I know he won't. Okay, thanks, lady. You fill me in. How do you know it? What's to stop him? Who reads the tea leaves? You or me? Neither one of us. The cops I already sent for. Tigers and the trappies. That's quite an act she's got. Yeah. Even wears a tiger skin. Yeah, not much of it. Uh, George, what did you mean back there asking people about Fedor as though you thought he's accident? Nothing, was... nothing, Angel. I won't question his accident. And I think he's ugly, too. But when you throw away all the trimmings, this is nothing but a love triangle, check? Well, nobody will thank us for interfering. Yeah, not even Briskin. And he's on the outside. But you know, sometimes in a triangle, Brooksy, the guy who looks like a villain is really the one who's liable to come out on the short end. Oh, here we are. Come on. Oh, she's not even through taking vows yet. Look at her. Blowing kisses Never like... Never mind. We'll do without... Uh-oh. Here he comes. Oh, the other part of the triangle. Yeah. He doesn't stay for the applause, I guess. Uh-huh. Kind of in a hurry, too. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Farrelly. Hey, sorry, no time now. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, sorry. But I want to talk I'm to sorry. you. I'm sorry. on earth. Now he's running, George. Got out fast, didn't he? Looked like he'd seen a ghost. Say, maybe there is something brewing George, out here. George, behind you, look out! Oh, no. Ooh. 
So I get the gun back after all. Over the head. It was Fedor, George. Oh. You were in the way and he I heard you, I heard you. I'm so happy you can hear. You can join the party. Who let you in, Lieutenant Johnson? I let myself in. George, Fedor didn't drop the gun. He he just hit you and kept on running. He was chasing Ferrelli. Uh. You send for cops to find a big homicidal nut running around loose. So who has to do the work? Me, naturally. Hey, hey, one at a time. What do, you, what do you mean? You got him? Yeah, yeah, just this second. One of the boys reported. What happened? George, what happened was murder. Murder? Well, I had to take care of you first, naturally, and so I stayed with you. And you were here in the infirmary when I saw Lieutenant Johnson, maybe half hour later. Sure, sure, but... Huh? Oh, he caught him, huh? Simple as that. Fedor shoved me out of the way and went after Forelli and got him. And now you've caught Fedor. George, it's not that simple. I mean, it's Estella who's been murdered. Yes, sir. Through the gate. What's over there? Elephant, sir. Yeah. Where's Estella's body? It's not out here in the dark. Back it's... in the trailer, George. Your dressing room. Hold it. I'll tell you later. Well, well, look who's here. The moose. Yeah, Fedor's not saying much, sir. He can't. Neither one of them can. Neither one of them? Sure. Ferrelli, too. Apparently, he came skinning over the wall in the dark and Fedor after him. All right, come on. Come on. Get on you, please. Yeah. Give me your flesh. This on. is very interesting, Valentine. Estella was struck over the head with a blunt instrument five minutes after you were. Boy always brings her coffee right after her act, and there she was. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Look at these two guys. Ooh, pretty bloody. That's how we found them. Guard heard the shot. Raised Fedor's leg. They were fighting over the gun. They were fighting, period. Husband and lover. Sure, sure, fighting. Still at it a few minutes ago. Well, what's the matter, Valentine? Don't you get it? Yeah. Yeah, I get it all right, Johnson. And it isn't simple at all. Fedor was chasing Ferrelli five minutes before Estella died. Now, later on, we find they've practically been killing each other. So how could either one of them have killed Estella? Boys, no pictures, I said. No pictures. It isn't good for the circus. What's the matter, Briskin? For once, you don't want publicity for the tiger? Look, stop it, will you? I got a wife and kids. Get your pictures later, boys. Let's get in here. Okay. Uh, sure. Quite a night, huh, Valentine? You should know. You started it. This where she was found, Johnson? Yeah. Okay, Sergeant, you can let those punching bags sit down. Now, wait a minute, somebody. I'd like to say something. Well, it speaks. Make it snappy, Ferrelli. He, he wasn't with me all the time. Huh? What's that? No, you see, I spotted him in the big tent at the end of the show. You see, one of the clowns, he told me that the Fedor just found out about who I was and everything. Anyway, I see him come after me. I know what kind of a guy he was from Estella, but he don't catch me. I mean, well, I run, but it was not until 10 or 15 minutes later that he caught up with so me. So you weren't together when she was killed. Now we're getting someplace. You're a real nice guy, aren't you, Ferrelli? Huh? Now, you listen to me. You ran, and then you skinned over a high fence to hide in that elephant enclosure. In the dark. And in the dark, he wasn't following you. But somehow, later on, he just managed to find you anyway. Lucky, maybe. Oh, uh, well, I mean, he must have a... W well, you see Oh, me no, no, not that simple. A couple of nice guys. You want to try to hang it on him now, Fader? <laughs> I do not understand. Hey, this rum been gone over yet? For fingerprints, sure. No prints. That's not what I meant, Johnson. The drawer and this bureau sticks. Let me see. I can do it, all right. All please. right, so it sticks. It's been shoved in too far. That's what I mean. Been slammed in. Somebody in a hurry, wondering what's inside. Hmm. Nothing. Jewelry. Where's jewelry? What's that? Jewelry. Bracelets around the neck and things. I'm her husband. I know that. Everybody knows that. Jewelry, huh? Pretty wealthy, wasn't she? Yeah. Hey, wait a minute, you guys. The stuff is in there. Whoever killed her must have taken it. I mean, that's why she was killed. Holy smoke, that spreads this case wide open. A robbery killing? I don't believe it. Oh, why not? Means lots of people could have done it. If these two guys were really fighting at the time, and anyway... you've got a wife and kids to worry about. What? 
What's the matter, Briskin? I make you nervous? Press agent. But you really admired that Estella, didn't you? What? What? Oh, wait a oh, minute. Oh, skip it. If this wasn't a robbery killing, then it was a real cold-blooded murder. Gloves so there'd be no fingerprints. Something stolen to make it look like robbery. But then it ruled out the hotheads over here, too. Neither one of them was in the mood to be cold-blooded, even if they hadn't been together at the time. A while ago, I said it was a triangle, and I still stick with it. All right, Fado, your wife was going to throw you over, wasn't she? Yeah. Yeah, she was very wealthy, a lot more than just jewelry. Yeah, but I never seen any of it. Ferrelli, you were the current boyfriend. But if you had half a brain, you could see the handwriting on the wall. Even if you became the next husband, you wouldn't have lasted very long either. Nobody does. And you wouldn't have seen any of the fortune either. You can say that again. Valentine, what in the I'm name of... I'm trying to people? play a different tune on a triangle, that's all, Johnson. Okay, Ferrelli, let's get back to how Fedor found you in the dark. Why you tried hiding from this monster in a place where nobody could even hear you call for help. But I don't know he was so close. I don't know he could just see me go over the fence. Then how did he know you did? How did he know where to find you? But I did see him. I was right behind him. Oh, uh, no, he don't. Oh, well, Wait. No, come on, come on. Make up your minds, boys. No, no, listen to me. The Triangle Club. The two sides of it nobody ever suspects. You two deliberately messed each other up to make everything stick. Two sides? But I hate him. He tried to kill me. Husband and lover against the wife. There's one for you, Johnson. You better find out fast who inherits that dough those guys couldn't have got their hands on any other way. We didn't. That's a stupid guy. He don't mean what he... He's a dumb man. You fake or you make a crazy... Shut up! Stupid. Get your hands off me! That's it, boys. Go at it again. Sure, he's so dumb he said you did it. I did not. He did. Shut up, Lothmo. He said you did the actual killing. He did it himself. Oh, I, uh, hey, look out. Get him off. Well, 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 throw up a chair, Johnson. We got a ringside seat. So, we'll just wait for a decision. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Fedor, who killed Estella. Yeah. Oh, boy, oh, boy, what a fight. If only I'd had a camera. <laughs> oh, both of them were guilty, Angel. They cooked it up together. Well, might not have happened if Mr. Briskin here... Had... Oh, yes, it would have. The publicity stunt didn't have anything to do with it. Sure, just a neat twist that they'd figured on a triangle game. Yeah, it might have worked. They might have got away with it if our friend here hadn't picked me for a sucker. Got us mixed up in it. Sure, that's right. So you're not so anymore, are you? Holy smoke, it's a job, that's all. I got a wife and kids oh. to... Oh, Buster, you're a broken record. My wife and kids, my wife and kids, my wife and George kids. George Valentine, you stop it. Huh? Well, it's just a shame you don't say anything intelligent like that once in a while. <laughs> What's the matter, darling? Your cat got your tongue? You have just heard Tune on a Triangle, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly, inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Just in case that voice you just heard didn't mean anything to you, that was George Valentine, with his usual commercial for Let George Do It. Now, before you listen to any more, 
You better make sure you have your winter woolies handy, because this is indeed a chilling tale. It's called The Marauder, and it's all about a guy who wants to bump off a cat. No, I don't mean his wife. I said cat, as in lion, tiger, panther, puma, or alley. Now this may sound pretty silly, but just hold base a while. Then make up your mind. Dear Mr. Valentine, my name is Rafe Saxon. I'm a writer, a very foolish writer, because like all of my breed, I've had a lifelong desire to spend a winter in the woods, to get away from the tensions and fears and neuroses of the city, to live simply with simple, normal people. Well, here I am, a tiny deserted resort in the Lobo Range, and of course, it's all an illusion. I'm surrounded by more tension and fear than I ever knew before. And a friend of mine, the owner of the place, Hans Bjorkman, has become neurotic to the point of insanity, to the point where I can't control him, to the point where all he thinks of is the marauder, the invader, the pirate and cutthroat of the animal kingdom. Mr. Valentine, this man is obsessed by the idea of murdering a mountain lion. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It. can only get out of this wind. Yeah, I got a big fire in the fireplace, lady. Hey, hey, where'd you leave your car? About five miles back, that hill beyond the Aspen Grove. Oh. Yeah, the road was like glass. <laughs> it's frozen practically solid. <laughs> hey, couldn't climb it, I know. Up one step and down two. <laughs> it's a funny winter this year. Hardly any snow, just ice cubes and hailstones. And here we go. Doors around the porch. Oh, thank heaven. Yeah, I don't think your friend Saxon's back yet. He's been oh. out communicating with nature. He's crazy like an Eskimo. Guess he's going to write a book about the South Pole. Hey, is your name Hans Bjorkman? <laughs> uh, me? Oh, heck no, no. He's crazy, too. Everybody is except me. <laughs> I- I'm just uh, peculiar. <laughs> hey, here, better wipe your feet. Listen! Hey? George, it's a woman! Something's the matter with it. Uh, what's it sound like to you, city boy? Well, it doesn't sound like a baby crying. What was it? Cat? Cat? Yeah, that's it. Cat, puma, cougar, panther, nuisance. Take your pick. Mountain lion. Mm. Oh. That's a bad winter for everybody, I guess. Hey. Sounds hungry, don't he? Yeah. <laughs> well, so am I. Come on, let's get inside. Only shut that door quick so Bjorkman don't hear it. You mean hear that whale? Why not? Uh, well, I don't, I don't know, mister... Something's going on I don't get the hang of. But when old Hans hears that long tail out there, he just sort of slides back in his rocker. Yeah, well, search me. I just poke cows for a living. It was Hans owned some cattle? No, no, no. A few head and some chickens, that's all. Uh, pairs of them, all in pairs like Noah sitting up in his ark. Uh, but I don't work here, if that's what you mean. I'm waiting for a job for the summer, that's all. Bears hibernate. Why shouldn't we? My name's Peanut. Peanut? Yeah, uh-huh, sure. I'm an uh, indoor-style cowboy. <laughs> I work two months, make enough playing bunkhouse pinochle to loaf the other ten. <laughs> yeah. oh, why not? I like to mosey around, keep people happy, make them laugh. <laughs> and old Hans, he's, he's been good to me a couple of times, so... So, here you are, huh? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I wish I knew why. wish I was smart enough to know how to help the old billy goat. Hey, he's old country and always hard to get close to, sort of proud. He built this place here with his own hands. He give you the shirt off his back, but... Peanut, he... is that them? Uh, what? Did Mr. Valentine... Oh, yeah, yeah, they're here. <laughs> Come on down, fatty. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've been getting your rooms ready, Miss Brooks. Uh, there's some hot chocolate for you on the stove. What? Oh, thanks. Uh, who's that? Tell Hans I'll be right there. Oh, we're fine, thanks. That his wife? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good kid if you don't go for too much brain. <laughs> you see, Hans just disappeared a couple of years ago and brought her back, and uh, here she is. Yeah, she works her head off, too, when she's not worrying about him. Everybody seems to worry about Hans. Yeah. 
It's over her head, too, I guess. I try to kid her out of it. She don't know what upsets him. Well, nobody knows, except the cat. Oh, here I am. Oh, I'm so sorry I wasn't downstairs when you came in. Hello, I'm Olga. Hello. Uh, how do you do? <laughs> well, w- w- what's the matter? Isn't my hair straight? <laughs> you see what I mean? Everybody's crazy. She says a thing like that and don't even look in the mirror to find out. <laughs> oh, be quiet. Your hair's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid Pinocchio gave us the wrong impression, that's all. He called you fatty. Oh, him. Well, she is. <laughs> well, come on, let's get that chocolate. Show. I guess we didn't expect you to be so young, that's all. What? Oh, gosh, I'm 26 already. <laughs> now, I never have time to fix myself up or... <laughs> oh, Pinochle, stop. Yeah, it. sure, sure. Just an ugly old frow. <laughs> stop what? No, <laughs> don't pay any attention to him. He's the most awful... <laughs> Hans. Well, <laughs> come in, come in. Well, I'm only kissing your wife, that's all. You don't have to point a gun at me. Huh? Oh, oh, oh excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> oh, there, there's nothing to listen to out there except the wind, darling. Of course. Hello, my dear. Well, these these are Miss Brooks and Mr. Valentine, the friends of Mr. Saxon. How do you do? It's such a pleasure. How do you do? Hello, Mr. Bjorkman. And I am the host, and I am late, and I let in the cold. There is no excuse. Have you poured me brandy, my dear? How are you, Mr. Valentine? My little place is so hard to get to, I'm afraid. Oh, fine, fine, thanks. Well, that's uh, quite a gun you've got there. (laughs) Yeah, he uses it to put holes in the broad side of his barn, don't you, Hans? (laughs) You are interested in guns? Good, good. Pinnacle and Saxon, they are boys. They don't understand. My rifle from the mail order house. Here, I show you. When a man has a house and his land, he has a gun. Uh, Yeah, well, (laughs) just don't wave it around. Wait a minute. There there wasn't anything, dear. Well... If you're listening for that lion... I didn't hear anything, Valentine. No, Hans. Oh, for heaven's sake... Be quiet! Pinochle, all I was going to say was that I did hear it. Sounded like it came from about the same place as the last time. Mr. Valentine... Be quiet, I said! Excuse me, please. I will see you later. Yeah. Yeah, he is out there. We could hear Mr. Valentine and I. Excuse me. Well, hello, everybody. Mr. Saxon. Are you Valentine? Yeah, hello. How do you like my nervous host here? Put it down, Hans, put it down. No hunting today, there's nothing out there. You have been outside, Rafe. You must have heard it. No, 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 just a little wind in the tree. Hans! Look out, you crazy! Give me that gun. I saw him, I tell you, I saw him. Give me that. And he left the barn. You couldn't hit anything at that range. Let go of me, I tell you, let go! Yeah, it is my house. It is my gun. It is up to me to kill the Narota. So, stay here, all of you. This time I will get him. Oh, brother. He shot past you in the doorway, Mr. Saxon. Maybe it scared you a little, but that's nothing to do. You've seen how he acts. Every day and night for the past week, he's been out trying to find that brute. He doesn't even take time to eat. Well, what's wrong with that? This is his place. He's got a few head of stock to worry about. A hungry lion is dangerous. Why shouldn't he try to kill it? Why should you all pretend you don't even hear it? No, no, listen to me. It's a long story. It isn't what he does, it's how he does it. It's not normal, it's not... Yeah, yeah, it's too long a story for me to listen to. What? Uh, Mr. Valentine? I'd rather see what happens myself, thanks. Me? I'm going to go out and help Hans run down his marauder. Oh, look, Hans, it's been an hour since I we know. started. I know. that circle we go in here. Yeah? Haven't even seen a track yet, have you? Ground is so hard. Look at the sky. It will snow maybe later on. Sure, sure, and by then my feet will be frozen. Hey, Hans, how many chickens or whatever you got has this thing actually... I have good, strong buildings. Nothing has been touched so far. But he is hungry. You can tell. Can you? You're not much of a hunter. I have worked all my life to build what I have. There's been no time for hunting, but I will find him. I will kill him. Ever think of traps or setting out poison? I will kill him myself. I will kill him and see him die. 
Well, how about calling in one of the state hunters to get him? I will kill him myself and see him die. You will, huh? He has no place in the world. He is a thief. This place is mine. For in my life, I've worked on it. And at night, he comes with his flat yellow eyes. Oh, yeah, I have seen him several times besides this afternoon, snarling, hungry, long as a man, crouching in the frozen grass. A thief, I tell you, with no business to come stealing a thief. All right, all right, all right, calm down. Why should I laugh and stand by when everything I own is threatened? Man, stop it, will you? (laughs) Man's castle is never secure, is it? (laughs) That? Look, the kitchen door is open. We will not find him tonight. I mean, you can work all your life for certain things and never be sure of hanging on to them. Like her. What did you say? Yeah, standing there in the doorway. Worried about you, I guess. Your young wife. Oh. All right, Olga, we're coming. Uh Uh-huh. She's very beautiful, isn't she, Hans? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Sure, sure, that's a compliment to you. Hans, did you ever hear of a man getting unreasonably mad at something? When that something isn't the real cause of his anger? I am tired. Please, you. You make so many... Taking it out on something, I mean, like the wrong marauder? What? Taking it out in hatred of a mountain lion. I don't understand. Now, come on. Come on, Hans. Tell me. Whether you admit it to yourself or not, which one of those guys in there are you worried about? Buddy? With Olga. You know which one it is you'd like to call a thief, a marauder? A sneak who comes into a man's home to steal his wife? No, stop it! Now take it easy. You can't say things like that! Oh, forgive me. She, Olga, is my wife. You do not understand. She is mine. Forgive me. Oh. Yeah, sure, Buster. I'll forgive you. Only which man is it? Which one do you really want to murder? You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. And now, back to George Valentine. Marauder, a hungry, dangerous mountain lion. Or is it a man? If your name is George Valentine, you're ready to agree with Rafe Saxon, the man who sent for you, when he said this place, this deserted resort in the frozen Lobo Range, is filled with tension and fear. And you'll also agree that the owner, Hans Bjorkman, is obsessed with the idea of murder. Only murder of what? Or of whom? No, this isn't the kind of place where one sleeps well at night. Even Claire Brooks. Particularly when... What? George. George! Yeah, sure, I'm awake. Come on in. Did you hear that? Yeah, shh. It was a rifle shot. Way off. Uh Uh-huh. When the wind's died down, could have been several miles. Not in that direction, I think. Well, it's so dark. There's no moon. Huh? Mr. Valentine? Oh, hello, Mrs. Bjorkman. Wake you up, too? I heard a shot. Where's your husband? Where do you think? The shot woke me up, and he was gone from bed. But here, his gun was gone, too. But I found this on the pillow. I know, huh? Oh, here, let me see. Olga, my dear, don't worry. I will be back soon. This time I know where to go. This time I will kill him and watch him die. Signed, Hans. George. Yes, Mr. Valentine. How could he know? What what could he know now that... Oh, well, I don't understand what... Listen. He could know what he wouldn't tell me. He could know which one it is that he wants... The lion. Same direction. You got a flashlight, Olga? What? George, wait. I'm going with you. There's a ladder. Wait for me, too. 
Hey, come on, step on it. Call Pinochle and Saxon, too. Listen. George, it was a door slammed. The other side of the house. Mr. Saxon isn't in his room either. One of them just took off the front way. Come on, they're both gone. We'll catch up with George, them. how can you tell what direction Oh, they... well, they'd go to find him, too. It has to be Hans. He has the only gun for miles and miles, and... Well, if he has found the lion at last... I got a pretty good bearing, I think. Besides, it's snowing a little. Come on, move fast. We gotta beat an awful lot of brush in an awful hurry. George, wait. Saxon, I... Have you seen Hans? I Have you... know, I know. I heard it. I'm looking, too. I saw your lantern half an hour ago, moving through the trees. Then I lost it. I think you're headed in the no, wrong... No, not, friend. You are. What? Well, I don't know. I was working late in my riding and in the room. The crazy hoot owl. I, I thought he was in bed. I came tearing sure, out... Sure, to... sure. Just give me your flashlight. Follow us with the lantern. All right, Mr. Valentine. He must have really gone off his head this time. Hans! Hans, can you hear me? I'll save your breath, Saxon. It's still across the field and down toward the little lake, I think. You can see way back on a line with the lights from the house. Ah, Snow in the face. Miserable, insane thing to be doing. Olga's a wonderful woman. I didn't You're say wrong. anything about Olga. She loves Hans. I know he's older than she is, but she does. Works her head off to make him happy. I told you I didn't say anything about her. But she's beautiful, all right. But then nature's rough. It's always paired off. But you can't protect a home forever when the ages are that far apart. You know the stuff Hans talks about. What should be done to marauders who try to break up the pairs. Uh, to the strays, the lone ones who try to break up a... Hey, Pinocchio, let you. Where are you? By the shore of the lake. Takes down of the house before you did, I guess. But the lights burned out. Here, get over here quick. Here, here, here give me that price. Oh, what is it? George, what's happened? Well, I, I stumbled. I dropped my light. Look. Look at my hand. It's blood. Yeah, I stumbled on something. Don't you get it? Hans got him. Don't you get it? The marauder. Look. Holy smoke. Look at the size of that mountain lion. So there really was one. Right through the eyes. Hey, hey, look here. He drilled him right yeah, through the eyes. sure. Close range. No wonder. Yeah. But look at the paw. The leg practically blown off. Hans must have had the muzzle practically you next to You want this, George? Yeah, give me that lantern. I, I can see something over here. Hans! Hans! Yeah, he's... Uh, he's dead, Mr. Valentine. Uh, look, only a few feet away, too. Now, the cat must have jumped him. Uh, they will sometimes, you know, hungry, skinny ones like that. That's why he fired so close, George. But not in time. Yeah, not in time to keep himself from bleeding to death, you mean? Look at those claw marks. All on right, his... I got eyes. Ah, no, take it easy, city boy. <sighs> but we better get him back to the house anyway, don't you think? Snow's getting worse. Sure, sure, it's a bad winter for everybody. Lion and all. Yeah. Here, take this handkerchief. Get some water on it, will you? Hmm? Oh, sure, sure. There's nothing we could have done, Valentine. It's like Pinochle says. Hans just slid back too far on his rocker. Nature caught up with oh, him. Oh, shut up. George. I'm all right. Just give me his gun there, will you, Saxon? Oh, uh, here. He's still hanging on to it. Huh? Yeah. Oh, uh, here. Uh, here, Valentine. You said you wanted this handkerchief wet. But there's almost enough snow on the ground. To cover things up. I know. Huh? Marauder. <laughs> Poor old crazy Hans. Valentine, what in the name I of... don't know, Buster, I don't know. But stand very still, both of you. Only three shells have been fired, but it's hard to keep you both covered in a place like this. Mr. Valentine... Olga, stay where you are. Your husband was murdered. What? George, what are you talking about? Pinochle, where'd you find the water? Huh? Valentine, if you don't know claw marks when you see Be them... Be quiet, will you? 
Pinochle, the water. Answer me, where? What? Way in the lake, naturally. Why isn't it frozen like everything else in this godforsaken country? Well, uh, the branches freeze and fall, that's all. They break the ice. I'm not that much of a city boy. Well, how should I know? Olga, come here. Hold this gun on him. Whatever you say. Yeah. Hang on to my hand, Brooks. Yeah, be careful, Hey, look out. That lake's over your head, man. Oh, you know about that, huh? Sure. Here's where the ice is broken. Well, that's just what I got to... listen, Pinochle. Three shells missing. And that's right. We heard a total of three shots, remember, Brooksy? Over an hour ago, back at the house. That's right, George, but I... the lion screamed after the third shot. You heard it. That's how it happened. Yes. Yes, I... Keep that gun straight. It's hard enough to even see people in this crazy place. But wait a minute. Hans killed the lion with a clean shot through the eyes. Close range, right through his brain. How could he have screamed after? He couldn't. So it doesn't make sense that Hans and the lion killed each other now, does it? Hey, wait a minute. Look here. Marks around the tree. What? Uh, let me see. A chain or something. Sure, sure. That's it. Hey, get a loose branch there. Hang on again, Brooksy. Oh, okay. What are you doing? Another real close shot smashed the lion's leg, didn't it? Or was it already smashed and the shot was just to cover up the marks there might be? I don't know yet. I'm just guessing. But I know one of you guys had nearly an hour alone out here after the shots to set the scene any way you wanted. Yeah. Yeah, there is something here. What is it, George? Something that might have been anchored to the tree originally. Something Hans would never use. But if somebody else did, then it would prove Hans wasn't jumped by that lion. He was... Oh, listen to him. Listen to him. Riddles. <laughs> he doesn't make a... A chain. And a trap, Angel. A steel trap on the end of it. The trap the lion was in ever since yesterday... Since he'd been screaming from the same place. Yeah, look, even bits of fur still on it. So it was murder. Why would anyone throw a trap in the... I'll take it from here, Saxon. Just help me out. Are you crazy? If it wasn't murder, it couldn't have been. There's a gun on you, friend. And I guess you're it, aren't you? Saxon wouldn't have got me here in the first place if he was going to pull one like this. Uh, Get away from me, you old... Look out, George! Hey, you... You get away! He's running! Give me a gun! Stop it, Olga! It doesn't do any good for you to kill him. He's gone. He's gone, Valentine. The Marauder's gone. He beat us here to the house, all right. He even got the telephone wires. Yeah, yeah. Leave daylight in a few minutes. Well, I'll start out. But where? He could be hiding almost anywhere outside. Oh, and... they'll get him. Don't worry, Saxon. Hasn't even got a gun. And if you ask me, he's running. <laughs> Marauder. Strike and run. I guess he did want to break up the family, didn't he? Kill Hans and then try to get Olga. Pinochle must have had that trap out before you even came here yesterday, Valentine. Yeah, that's right. And then he had to go through with it. But, George, how could you have guessed what not even Hans guessed that Pinochle was really getting ready to murder him. Wording of that note to Olga, remember? Oh. Hans went out after the lion. Said he knew just where to go, just where to get him. Well, how could he have been so sure? Unless somebody had come to him in the night and told him where it was. Pinochle. And he led him out there until they came to where the lion was, screaming in the trap. Yeah. And then Pinochle had all the time in the world sure, to... Sure, sure, kill them both. The rest was easy. And it would have worked. Nobody would have investigated. The snow would have covered everything. And the human thief, the worst marauder, might have eventually persuaded Olga to... What's the matter, George? Holy George. smoke. I just figured out why Pinochle stopped by here at the house, that's all. Why? He's running, all right. The keys to my car are gone. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. (sighs) Chin up, Angel. We parked around this bend, remember? Look, the snow didn't cover all his tracks. You can see where he came. He was running. George, 
I'm still trying to figure that business of the shot and the scream. Yeah. No matter, no matter how you add it. Doesn't make sense, I know, Brooks. Mm, Pinochle laughed. City boy, he said. Well, that was what started me going, because I thought it was impossible. But I've just realized even when we knew about the murder, it was still impossible. Look. Look, the car, it's still down there. He didn't take it. Oh, Lord, no, those tracks. Well, it's nothing to... Where are you going? The Marauder, Angel. Well, look at those tracks. Look why Pinochle was running. Something else I should have caught. Lion was in the trap all day yesterday, but Hans saw a lion and fired at it down by the barn around dusk. We just thought he was seeing things. But it was another lion screaming. Pinochle! There he is! There he is! Dead. He couldn't even make it to the car. Oh, no, easy. Don't look at him, Brooksy. Oh, George. It's all right, Angel. It's all right. Dangerous thing to be a marauder, isn't it? To murder a husband or a wife. Nature's the same all over, I guess. Everything in pairs. Pinochle was killed by the lion's mate. have just heard The Marauder, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Same old hat, Abby. What's the matter with it? It's not 
probably find your hat, Sam. Well, that's what you're looking at. I'm trying to avert my eyes, Sam. Here's a suit. Oh, oh. oh I forgot. Well, uh, look out the window, Effie, now. Uh, that's a phone call. Maybe a job. I gotta meet a man. Sam, you can't go on a job now. Why not? Why do you think I got your suit, Sam? The man's coming to take your picture. Well, what man? From Babbling Detective Magazine. Oh. Well, I'll try and make it for you. Oh, Sam, I'm tired of making excuses to people. I set up this appointment for 5.30, and I went to Zach in plenty of time. I wish you wouldn't go. <laughs> oh, all right, go on. But if you aren't back in this office by 5 o'clock, that's, that's 10, Sam. You can, you can find someone else to make your excuses. Okay, okay. Shall we synchronize our rockets? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'll, uh, I'll be in touch with you. 
Outside, the fog was rolling in. I stopped under a street light and spent an estimated 45 seconds trying to figure out what time it was for the calendar watch my secretary gave me for Christmas. The barometer was falling, it said. The temperature was 63, and I was facing northwest. I looked at a jewelry store to find out it was 423. My hour was nearly half gone, and the only clues I had were a cigarette case and a black eye. I took the case out of my pocket and opened it. There were cigarettes in it. I took one out and lit it. It was nasty. And I saw something green behind the cigarette. It looked better. It looked like money. When I examined it more closely, I wasn't so sure. The printing on it was Dutch, and the amount was 100 florins. <laughs> but it only cost me two nickels and a pay telephone to find out where to take it. It was a small but solid-looking establishment on Montgomery. The gold lettering on the plate glass window said Van Pelden Meisner, commercial agent, Amsterdam, New York, San Francisco, MacArthur, and Curacao. Gentlemen here. I uh, want to see Mr. Meisner. Uh, there is no Mr. Meisner. There's only Van Pelt, and I'm Hendrik Van Pelt. I'm so sorry. Oh, I don't feel like that. Maybe you can help me. What can I do with you? Well, uh, somebody paid me off for a job in Dutch money. I want to know how much it's worth. Oh, this better than Meisner, I know. The value of money. Show me, please. Uh, Maybe you'd like a cigarette, too. That's Dutch. Please. My brand, Sumatra Queen, Sam. Oh, good. You like good, it? Sumatra Queen. No, the money. 100 florins. I under the light look. Huh? Uh, serial number. Uh, here is M. Quadrate clear. Uh, seal should color it. Paper. Paper excellent. Give it this shade. What's it worth? La look. Uh, latest quotation. Uh, Florin against the dollar. Uh huh. Yeah. Fifty-three. Dollar thirty-four cents. That's what the exchange fee take now. Uh, you like ten dollar notes? I love them. You mean that money's real money? Who knows better than I should? Eh? My brother was engraver to the Royal Dutch Treasury. <laughs> I myself in the manufacturing was until the occupation coming was. <clears throat> Pardon me. Would you mind saying that again, please? Uh, oh, in the manufacturing from all kinds of money, including already currencies from the Indies, East and West, Java. Tel Aviv, Borneo, and Homeland, Netherlands. Yeah? Mm. Also, six months in Bulilong, Bali, where I'm English learning. <laughs> oh, you learned <laughs> English? Several foreign languages. Uh, 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 well, I'll take it in ten. Uh, go, uh, uh. <laughs> ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, one, two, three, is it? Dime cents and twenty cents. Did I say that? Yes. Oh, eventually. I spoke a little bit. Yes, uh, eventually you have lived in San Francisco for how long? Oh, uh, eventually quite some time. Oh, uh, I'm Henrik Van Pell. How are you? How do you do? Yes, I, I, I know this on the cigarette case. You have the same initial, HP. <laughs> uh, who your name is, please? Uh, uh, Paul House, uh, Herman Paul House. Oh. You know, Paul House, you know, I, I like that. Cigarette case. <laughs> With the coincidence, you sell me your Dutch money. <laughs> Maybe also sell me the cigarette case with the Dutch cigarette. You like those cigarettes? Oh, I love that Sumatra Queen. Can you have them for nothing? <laughs> no, no, such a pity to remove them from the beautiful case. They go together, cigarettes and the case. How, how much? What would you say it's worth? Well, that's good gold. Five hundred dollars? What do you pay? Nothing. I take it out of a dead body. <laughs> Get out! Get out! Grave robber! Help! Police! Stop thieves! Okay, Help. okay, Mr. Van Pelt, I'm going! Help! Police! Help! 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 I ran to my walk to the only exit. A squad of bank cops trying to pass me, followed by half a dozen city dicks and some firms men who confused Van Pelt's burglar alarm with that of the bank next door. Nobody paid me any mind until I reached Clark Street. I was just crossing. When I saw it the second time, it was the same car that had run down Hank Page. I strained my eyes against the headlights. I couldn't make out the man behind the wheel, but I got the license plate before it happened. I felt it before I heard it. It hit my chest like a sledgehammer. I 
The last thing I heard was the footsteps of a heavy man pounding toward me. The clock on the church of business of faith was chiming the half hour. <laughs> Why he invited me to have this drink with him? I can think of one way. Oh, thank you. Listen, he, he, he wants to buy Hank's cigarette case. And, of course, much as I see an Indian boo-boo, Mr. Spade. Yeah. Well, you know, Hank didn't need much, only a little insurance. And the printing shop is a partnership, you know, Hank and Mrs. Delay. And mm-hmm. the cigarette case is just a windfall. I told him you wouldn't stand in the way of a widow. Well, I wouldn't think of it. I knew you'd do the decent thing, Mr. Spade. Give me the answer. Uh, please, please, Mr. Spade, my brother. Besides, I haven't got it. You haven't got no, it? No, now, look, 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 Mr. Fay. Blanche. Okay, now, Blanche, try and think. Did you ever hear your husband mention Van Pelt? No. No, they... No, they never even met. Mr. Van Pelt said so. Well, how'd Van Pelt find out about the cigarette case? He said you showed it to him. Uh-huh. Oh, well, you know your husband's partner, Mr. Soleil. Oh, we're total strangers now. I told my husband everything. He forgave me. Uh-huh. And what did Mr. Soleil tell you? Nothing much, nothing. He's led a very dull life. Almost as soon as he got out of reform school, he took a forgery there. Oh, very good. Nice. That's where he became a, a master fitter. And stir, did you think? Oh, yes, they do. They're not much help. Au contraire, Blanche. Au contraire. I escorted her outside and pushed her into a taxi. Then I walked back to Church Street. As I rounded the corner, I could see light in the window of Pace and Frederick. Chimes were hammering out a quarter of five when I entered Hank Page's shop. In the back, the guy was sitting at a desk in his shirt sleeve, checking off figures in a ledger. I introduced myself, and he told me his name was Ben Soleil. He shook hands, and then he waved me to a chair across the desk. Uh, this is awful, Sage. What with one thing and another, we're heels over head and work, and got to pull with these books, and I don't know a thing about it, Mike. Oh, pardon me. Yeah. Oh. Oh, well, things are a little confused there just now. Could you tell me a little more about it? Huh? Oh, yes, I understand the problem. Well, we're handling it at this end, but we'll be very busy for a while. Yeah. Now, there's definitely no point in you dropping by tonight. I know you think the news of the boss's death would make some difference to those customers, but no. He take that fellow that just... Yeah, I know you're very busy, Mr. Shuley, and I don't want to take up too much of your time, so... Say, uh, what makes you think that car deliberately ran down the boy? Did I say so? Well, you're an insurance dick, aren't you? You got me tagged. Anybody have anything against them, as far as you know? No, well, he, he fired two printers last week. Why? Well, they couldn't spell in English. You uh, see Mr. Page this afternoon? Yeah, he came in for about ten minutes. Said he'd be back on the job tomorrow morning. He was killed this after he left. How do you look? Oh, same as usual. You wouldn't say he'd been in a fight. Oh, good Lord, no. He was a sick man. He had a piece of porn in his hand when he was hit. Know anything about that? Well, sure, he got it here. One of our customers, a man named Van Pelt, paid for some work with him. Boss wanted it for a souvenir, so he took it with him. Uh, does Van Pelt know about Page's heart? Oh, that's a stupid question, Ed. You didn't know Page was killed with Van Pelt's car. Uh, that's a long shot, sir. Thanks, here's another one. You're a lion, straight down the line. Huh? You, no, didn't, wait you didn't see Page today. If he had you to mention that he had a black eye, he didn't take that Dutch money for a souvenir. If he had you to mention the cigarette case, you set it up. <laughs> what are you doing, shutting down for the night? You'll find out. Put your hands on top of the desk. I 
put the muzzle of my gun. I've been holding it in my lap for three minutes, flying up over the edge of the dust for Ben to later see it. He did what I told him to. The press room door was directly behind him, and I knew his body would screen my gun from the view of anybody that might come through in response to the signal he sent. I didn't have long to wait. Three men, black with ink, came to the door and threw it into the little arm. They strolled in, careless and casual. What's up, Ben? You got ice in your head? Huh? What's this? Get out of my ass there. Stop right there. They stopped as if they'd all been mounted on the same pair of legs, but I didn't like my position at all. If these men decided to jump me, I could down just one of them before the other three were on me. I knew it, and they knew it. Then I felt some fresh air on the back of my neck as the street door opened behind me. Oh. Mr. Ray, what is it? Is it a hold-up? It's me, Blanche Spade. Get out of here quick. Find a cop and bring him back here. Will you do that? Sure I will. You can count on me. Ray's mouth opened in a broad grin. I didn't need any more warning than that. I threw myself sideways, but I wasn't quick enough. The blow I got from behind was Blanche's lady's handbag type persuader. It didn't hit me full on, but I got enough of it to fold up my legs as if the knees were hinged with paper and I slammed into a heap on the floor. Something dark crashed towards me. I crossed with both hands. I had foot kicking in my face. I wrung it the way it was. I got a knock. I was dimly aware that my feet were under me again. Some squirming thing was on my back, and a hot, damp object like a hand was across my face. I put my teeth into it. My head back as far as it would go. Maybe it smashed into the face it was meant for. I don't know. Anyway, the squirming thing was no longer on my back, and suddenly I could see again. I saw a brass cuspidor six inches or so in front of my eyes. That's how I knew I was down on the floor again. I grabbed the cuspidor and tugged at it. I sang it to my feet with it and used it to clutter clear space in front of me. I swung it high and let go. I was back on the floor again with six or eight hundred pounds of flesh hammering my face into the floor. But you can't throw a brass cuspidor through a plate glass window into a rush hour crowd in downtown San Francisco without attracting attention. The hour of rescue was at hand. Exactly five feet. Hey, and Aunt Clancy is the most of the crop. You guessed it. It was a counterfeiting paper with variations. The returns are not all in yet, but I think when the feds pick up Van Pelt, they'll find he was telling the truth when he said he was working in the Dutch government printing office in Amsterdam at the time of the Nazi occupation. He probably bought his, bought his way out of the country with the same kind of money he and Soleil were printing here. Genuine Dutch Florence printed from the original plate. Being a skilled metal worker, he designed a gold cigarette case into which those plates would fit with uncanny accuracy. The crowning touch was the way in which he concealed them from view. He filled the case with an odious brand of Dutch cigarettes, which only fools or criminals could possibly smoke. It was the safest hiding place in the world. So clever was it, now get this fancy boy... That even I, Sam Spade Detective, never suspected the presence of base metal until it stopped that slug Van Pelt threw at me in the alley. Period. End of report. Oh, Sam, to think you went through all that just to keep your promise to me. Yes, Abby, but uh, what hurts even more than these wolves is the thought that you've died my word. Oh, I didn't say that, Sam. I only inferred that you had no sense of time. Yeah? Well, I guess you've changed your mind about that, eh? No, I haven't. May I ask why? Well, I'd rather not discuss it during working hours, Sam, but as soon as I typed up this report, I'll tell you exactly what I mean. Good night. 
Good night, sweetheart. Good night. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Paul Brennan, Inter-Allied Insurance Company, Johnny. Oh, hi, Paul. How's the world doing by you? Oh, I got troubles. Oh, like what? Like Albert W. Winkler. Winkler? Who's he? Maybe you mean who was he? Well, which is it? Well, that's the trouble, Johnny. We don't know. Huh? Well, he's disappeared, and with him a hunk of emerald worth exactly 100,000 clams. Wow. Well? Sure. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of a man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Inter-Allied Insurance Company, Dawson Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Blooming Blossom matter. Expense account item one, a dollar even. Taxi from my apartment to the offices of Interallied, where Paul Brennan wasted no time in getting to the point. Albert Winkler was a partner in a small jewelry firm down in New York. Real exclusive type place. Lord and Winkler? Yeah, that's the outfit. Well, a few days ago, they got hold of an emerald. It's called the Green Eye of Calcutta. And Johnny, the darn thing's big enough to choke a horse. Okay, Paul, okay. I don't think you need to go any further. No, wait. They plan to put it on an exhibition at the big international jewelry show in Chicago next month. And Winkler took it home to work on it. Oof. Insured for 100000 you said. Yeah, and Winkler's insured for ten. Okay, so who killed him and stole the rock? Listen, will you? Go ahead. Well, Sunday morning, his partner Blewett tried to phone him at his apartment. No answer. So Blewett sauntered down to the office thinking he might be there. But no sign of him? Right. Nor of the green eye of Calcutta. Only a note Winkler had left the night before saying he was taking a stone home to work on it. Well, that makes it look as though maybe Winkler... Listen. About that time, the phone rang there in the office. It was the police department also looking for Winkler. Oh. Yeah, they'd been called by Winkler's landlord after a chambermaid had found his apartment completely ransacked and the old boy missing. Uh Uh-oh. Who's working on it? For the NYPD, I mean. Uh, Sergeant Randy Singer, 18th Precinct, Homicide. Old friend of yours, I believe. Yeah, good man. Has he come up with anything? Nothing. Well, Johnny? Sure, Paul. Now? Now. Item two, another dollar for a taxi back to my apartment where I slicked the stubble off my face, showered, dressed, and was about to head for New York when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar? That's right. Oh, good. Well, who's that? Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Dollar. Huh? I must talk with you, sir. It's important, very important. Well, who are you? Me? Well, this is Wilbert Kenworthy Blossom. Yes, and I must see you right away. Well, what's this all about, Mr. Uh, Blossom, did you say? Oh, why, that's right. How did you know that? Oh, is this some kind of a gag? It certainly is not. And to think that now I'll be working with you on a... Oh, it's wonderful. Just wonderful. What are you talking about? Why, you. Don't you see? I follow every single one of your cases, sir. Either in the newspapers or on the radio. Oh, I'm your biggest fan. Is, uh, is that all you call to say, Mr. Blossom? It is not. I'm calling about the mysterious disappearance of Mr. Albert Winkler. Winkler? You know something about him? His whereabouts? I certainly do. Where are you, Mr. Blossom? Uh, Here at my house in New York, and I'll be waiting for you, sir. Goodbye. No, wait. Give me your address. Oh, oh, yes, of course. How could you know where to come if I hadn't given you that? (laughs) That was silly of me. Well, goodbye. The address, man, the address. Oh, Oh, of course. It's 825 East 73rd Street. Item three, $9.20, transportation and incidentals to New York City and 825 East 73rd Street. It turned out to be one of New York's famous old brownstone houses, well-preserved and reeking of an era long past, when the city's wealthy and elite had built row on row of these monuments to a now-forgotten financial aristocracy. Oh, come in, Mr. Dollar. Come in. I'm Wilbert Kenworthy Blossom, and I cannot tell you how thrilled I am to be working with you on this. I don't know how to describe it, but I'll try. 
The inside of Blossom's home was unbelievable. Ornate pre-Victorian furnishings, heavy velvet draperies, huge lamps and chandeliers, gilt frame mirrors, even an ancient horsehair sofa. It was also filled with dusty piles of newspapers and magazines, hundreds of old books. Travel books, Mr. Dollar, and mysteries. Oh, I just love mysteries. One corner of the high ceiling living room was piled with old trunks and handbags, an old carpet bag even. Boxes of tools and utensils were stacked about. An ancient Victrola, beat-up sewing machine. You just never know when you might want to sew something, do you? Old guns and pistols, some of them museum pieces. A stringless tennis racket. A pair of rusty handcuffs locked to the base of a floor lamp without a shade. A broken bicycle pump. That's just in case I ever find a bicycle to go with it, you understand. Uh, yes. Against one wall stood an old metal cabinet loaded with rusty surgical instruments and a worn-out catcher's mitt. Yet... Directly opposite was a corner shelf full of priceless porcelain figurines and rare pieces of china. Some of the old clocks and jewelry on the mantelpiece were collector's items. Fine original oil paintings lay among piles of old shoes. All in all, it looked as though the contents of half a dozen pawn shops had been dumped into it. At auction sales, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes, sir. I just cannot resist an auction sale or a bargain. But what are you going to do with all this stuff? Oh, just keep it. I like it. I like a lot of things. Yeah, so I see. Including 12 gross of Spencer's superlative steel tip shoelaces patented 1841. They were a bargain, Mr. Dollar. Just like all this fine artwork is. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. <laughs> Some of my friends pamper me a bit, though. You know, send me things they pick up at sale. Yeah, now look, Mr. Blossom, you told me you know something about Albert W. Winkler. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Well? And think of that magnificent emerald. Gone. Disappeared? Yeah, but now you said... And that poor Intralight Insurance Company. Oh, my. That's how I knew you would be called on this case. But a hundred thousand dollars... And ten thousand dollars on Mr. Winkler. Well, at least they're off the hook on him until he's proved dead. Aha. And that's where I come in. With proof. Proof? What proof? Have you seen Wink? Mr. Dollar... I have. Well, where is he? You understand, of course, that I know Mr. Winkler very well because I've seen him at his office so many times. Yeah, okay, go on. Oh, go on. yes, indeed. Such beautiful, beautiful jewelry he had there. And, of course, he was always trying to buy some of the things I but had. But you say you've seen him. Where? Well, Saturday I'd planned with a couple of old friends to attend a railroad auction. Uh, that was the Canyon City and Metropolitan Railroad. Winkler was there at the auction sale? Oh, uh, yes. Did you speak to him? Oh, no. Well, why not? You said you knew him. Well, I didn't go to the auction. I wasn't feeling very well that day. I had a little... <clears throat> a little cough. <sighs> it was kind of like that. Then how do you know he was there? My friends went. And at least they talked about going. Mr. Blossom. And I'm sure they did, too, because they sent me something from... And what do you suppose it was? I don't know. I don't care. Now, look here. You got it me It to... was the very thing that has solved this whole case for you. What? And think of it. This dull drab, dreary life of mine has suddenly become... Why, it's almost like a mystery story, isn't it? Adventure and... Look, Mr. Blossom, think of would it, you... Think of it. I'm being a detective. I'm working with my idol, the famous Johnny Dollar. Oh, George. Mr. Blossom, what did they send you? What's that? Oh, oh yes. Oh, so <clears throat> uh, here. Here it is, sir. It's right here between the erector set and the golf clubs. This old trunk? That's right. Oh, great Scott, you think you do. But at first, of course, I, I thought of calling the police. But knowing all about you... Mr. Blossom, let me see that. Excuse me. There are a lot of crumpled newspapers on top. Yeah, I see. As old as the trunk. Good Lord. It, uh, It isn't pretty, is it? Sergeant Randy Singer, homicide. Randy, Johnny Dollar, get somebody over to 825 East 73rd Street right away, will you? Body of Albert Winkler. Randy got there in a matter of minutes, got the same story from Blossom that I had, then called for the lab crew to come and take over. Now, now, who delivered this trunk, Mr. Blossom? But it was just, um, just a delivery man. Can you describe him? Would you know him if you saw him? Yeah, well, he was big and strong. He was very strong. Distinguishing features, scars or a limp or a beard or well, something? Well, I told you, Johnny, he was big and strong. How old? Well, I would say he was somewhere between 25 and, um... 
Yeah? Fifty. Uh, yes, I'm sure. Well, that's a lot of help. Yeah, you better have those thick spectacles changed. But he was big. Yes, we know, and strong. What about his truck? Oh, I didn't see that. He left it outside. No. Now, look. These friends of yours who did attend the auction, who were they? Oh, oh yes. Now the investigation proceeds. Now the excitement... Who were they, Mr. Blossom? Uh, oh. Well, there's a uh, Randolph Harrison and... Randy Singer took down the names of Blossom's three auction-minded friends. The lab crew arrived, Randy took off to dig up Blossom's friends, and I took a cab, that's item 480 cents, to the apartment of Elwood Blewett, Winkler's partner in the jewelry business. Blewett lived alone in a modest but tastefully furnished five or six rooms on East 52nd Street. Of course, Mr. Dollar. I'll be glad to help you all I can. Albert's death has been a terrible blow. Yes. Well, tell me this, please. Yes? Did Mr. Winkler make a habit of taking valuable pieces of jewelry to his residence? Yes, Albert often took pieces home with him to work on them, clean, polish, and so on. Wasn't that a rather dangerous practice? Frankly, I always thought so, but he felt there was far more chance of being robbed if he were alone at the office than at his flat, where he wouldn't be expected to have anything of great value. Well, who has seen the green eye of Calcutta besides you and Mr. Winkler? I'm not sure. Of course, almost anyone would have been able to recognize it. Because of the publicity and pictures when you brought it over here? Yes. Come to think of it, Blossom indicated he'd been much impressed with it. Wilbur Blossom? Yeah. You know him? He's been in the office many times. He and Albert were always bickering over pieces that either bickering? of us... Bickering? Well, it was really something of a joke. Albert always wanted some of Blossom's heirloom pieces, and Blossom wanted some of the finer things we had. Did he ever buy? Never. He always wanted us to put them up at auction or at a bargain price. Hardly our way of doing things, needless to say. When did you last see Blossom? By last Friday. I was busy with an important client, and from the back room where Albert worked, I remember hearing Blossom insist that Albert show him the emerald. What did he? I don't know. The silly argument got so noisy that I closed the door on them. Hmm. Oh, now wait... Certainly you aren't thinking that perhaps Wilbert Blossom... I'm not quite certain what I'm thinking, Mr. Blewett. Item five, ten cents, phone call to Randy Singer. No, not a thing, Johnny. One of the three names on Blossom's list is in Europe. The other two did go to the railroad auction, but purchased nothing. Randy, do a couple of things for me, will you? Like what? Phone whoever is stationed at Winkler's place that I want to look it over. Sure, everything is just as it was, including the poker that was used to kill him. Also, I want a copy of the picture of the trunk your lab boys took and the list of Blossom's friends. I'll have them waiting for you. And post a man at Blossom's place. Keep an eye on him. Hmm? Yes, right away. Johnny, have you learned something? That... No, no, just, uh, well, just for his protection, say. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, but I... Blossom. Yeah, Blossom. Maybe I hadn't given enough thought to the strange little character. Or to why the trunk with Winkler's body had been at his place. But if he were involved, why call me in? Cover up? Possibility. But Wilbert Blossom kill a man? Yeah, maybe he could. Maybe he did. I'd better see him as soon as I get through with the inspection of Winkler's apartment. Mr. Dollar? Oh, hi, officer. Did Sergeant Singer call and tell you that... He's on the phone here in the Winkler apartment now. Wants to talk to you. Says it's very urgent, sir. Okay, thanks. Johnny Dollar. Johnny, how did you know? Huh? The man I sent to cover Blossom's house for you got there too late. What? Whoever got in and attacked the poor old coot got away. Attacked? Blossom? Yeah, really did a job on him. Johnny? <sighs> okay, Randy. Thanks. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Democracy. As everyone knows, democracy means many things. Self-rule of the people, a higher standard of living, freedom of speech, press and religion, rights and privileges, liberty. But the most vital promise of democracy is mankind's right to dignity. For it is through the dignity of man that democracy has given mankind its greatest legacy of freedom. 
Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Blooming Blossom Matter. Expense account item six, two dollars and a quarter for a fast taxi ride to 18th Precinct Police Headquarters. All right. As soon as I got your call, Johnny, I sent a uniformed man over to Blossom's house. From the way you talked, I thought maybe you suspected him. Yeah, Randy, I'm afraid I did. Boy, how wrong can you be? Anyhow, when he got there, he found the front door open and Blossom lying in the dark hallway. Where's Blossom now? In the hospital, but he's okay, just bruised up a bit. They're letting him out. Fingerprints? Anything to go on? The lab's checking on the prints right now. Uh-huh. Let me know. Yeah. Anything else? Nope. So, now let's find out who tried to put Blossom out of the way and we'll have the guy who killed Winkler. And stole the hundred thousand worth of emerald, then shipped Winkler's body to Blossom. Oh, uh, and by the way, here's the picture of the trunk you asked for and the three names Blossom gave me. Harrison, Norton, and Scatterday. What are you going to do with them? Randy. Hmm? Suppose the man who attacked Blossom is the one who did all the rest. You got a better suppose? Well, look, Randy, whoever wielded that poker on Winkler couldn't have been very strong. A really hefty wallop would have bent it out of shape. And the lab agrees with you. But, of course, it didn't take much of a blow to finish off old Winkler. He didn't weigh much over 100 pounds, you know. Yeah. Any strong arm could have finished him off easily and without messing up the whole apartment. And don't forget, whoever did him in also put him in the trunk and delivered it to Blossom's house. But why? Yeah. Yeah, and where's the emerald? That's what you should be worried about. A hundred grand worth of worry for your insurance company. Now, what are you going to do with that picture of the trunk and the list of Blossom's friends? Oh, yeah, sure. Hmm? I'll see you later. Item seven, five dollars and a half for a taxi to the warehouse of the Canyon City and Metropolitan Railroad over in Jersey. There I finally managed to track down a man who knew something about their occasional auction sales of unclaimed baggage and stuff. Insurance investigator, eh? Huh? That's right, Mr. McKinney. One of those boys with a fancy expense count, eh? Well, that's a matter of opinion. Look, you had an auction sale here last Saturday, didn't you? That's right. Handled it myself. Want to know something about uh, something we sold off? Exactly. Then I'm your man. Always remember all about every single item I sell and who bought it and, and all about them. That's fine. Because I want to know if any of the names on this list bought from you on Saturday. Yeah. Randolph Harrison. Man by the name of Harrison buy anything? Mm, nope. How about Percival Wentworth Scatterday? Nope. Ellsworth Norton? Nope. You sure, Mr. McKinney? I'm sure. How, uh, how about Blossom? That a man's name? Yes, Wilbert Blossom. Well? No, sir. Nope, never heard of him. And like I told you, I never forget the stuff I sell or the fellas I sell it to. Wait. This picture of a trunk. Huh? Have you ever seen this trunk? Well, yes. Did you sell this trunk on Saturday? Yes, I did. To whom? Come on, man, it's important. Well, uh, now, I was real early in the sale. Yeah, before most of the people got here. Uh, bought this trunk and had it sent to his apartment in New York. And his name? Well, it was a funny kind of name. Uh, Blinky or Winky or... Uh, oh, no. Winkler. Winkler. That was it. Albert Winkler. I'd have made two dollars, two drinks for myself at the nearest bar. But they didn't help to kill my feeling of utter frustration. Item 9550 taxi back to 18th Precinct headquarters in New York for want of a better place to go. Well, it's about time you got here, Johnny. Oh. Uh, we matched up the prints we found after Blossom was attacked. You know who made them? Yeah, here's his card. Carlo Bernasconi. Any reckon? A couple of a dozen arrests, only one conviction. Anything to do with jewelry? Better. Accessory to a hijack operation a couple of years ago. He drove the truck. Hey. Sure. Got a mugshot of him? We got him. Downstairs. Come on, I'll take you down. Randy, what's he look like? Like you'd expect the truck driver to look, big husky brute. Has he admitted anything? Well, the threat of a murder charge made him talk, all right, but none of it makes any sense. Of course it doesn't. But he's our boy, all right. He killed Winkler, beat up Blossom. I thought your lab decided whoever killed Winkler was a small fella. Mm, yeah, I So the theory about the same man killing Winkler and beating up Blossom doesn't work. But Johnny, holy... Come on down, let's talk to this Bernice Cone. After I make a phone call. Huh? Who to? Yeah? Get me a man named McKinney, Canyon City and Metropolitan Railroad Warehouse over in Jersey. Make it fast, please. Yes, sir. Hey, you been over there, Johnny? Just before I got here. Did you find out anything? No, but I'm going to now. Like what? Randy, for the first time, this whole thing is beginning to make sense. Here's your party. Mr. McKinney? That's me. This is Johnny Dollar, remember? Sure do. Good. And say, now, 
I've been reading in the paper since you left here about that body found in the trunk over there in New York. Yeah, well, look. In that same, is that same trunk you was over here asking about? Yes. Now, you told me that trunk was bought by a man who gave his name as Winkler. That's right. Do you remember what he looked like? Sure do. Why, I can give it to you as accurate as if it was in the police file. Well? Height, uh, mm, five foot nine, maybe nine and a half. Go on. Weight, between 155 and 58. You see, when I was young, I worked with a carny show guessing weight and height, and if I didn't guess it right... Yeah, okay, okay. Now, how about the uh, color of the eyes? <laughs> well, I noticed them because of the way he squinted through them thick, old-fashioned steel glasses. He... Thanks, Mac. I'm sending you a ten spot in the next mail. Well, now... Well, Johnny? Come on, Randy. Let's get down and see this Bernasconi. You find something out new? Yeah. And I don't like it. I don't like it. Now, look, Bernasconi, you're in plenty of trouble for the assault on Blossom. Maybe even more. But I'm the man who can save you from a murder rap. If you'll answer a couple of questions. Ah, uh, sure. I told the cops. All right. All right. Did you pick up and deliver a trunk yesterday morning? Sure, I told him. For a guy named Winkler. You got the trunk from Winkler? Sure, at his apartment on East... What did he look like? How tall? Uh, maybe five, eight, or ten. What? Johnny... Slight uh... build or heavy or what? I'd say about medium. Maybe 150 pounds. Johnny... Now look, mister... Now wait a minute, you look. Did you deliver that trunk to a man named Blossom? Sure, at 825 East 73rd Street. What did he look like? Him I never see. I knew it. He hollered from a window that the door was open and I should put the trunk in the living room. <laughs> what a junk house. But you must have seen him later when you came back and assaulted him. It was night then. When he come to the door, I just slugged him and let him lay there. Then I went inside where the lights was on to look for... Well, to look for the big rock I'd read about in the paper. But then I heard a prowl car coming, so I beat it. Trunk wasn't there anyway. Okay, Bernasconi. See you later, Randy. Now, just a minute. Hey, and what about me? You said it... Item 10, 90 cents, taxi to Wilbert Blossom's old brownstone house on East 73rd. Come in, come in, Johnny. Thanks, Mr. Blossom. All recovered from your beating? Oh, of course I am. Here, sit down, sit down. You, uh, you said you wanted to help me on this case. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Why, this chance to work with a man I consider the finest insurance investigator in the world. Yeah. That's why I called you when I got the trunk with Mr. Winkler's body in it. Mr. Blossom, why don't you tell the truth? All my drab, dull life, I've wanted to be a detective, an investigator. And this was my chance. My chance to... Tell the truth, did you say? (sighs) Mr. Blossom, listen to some facts for a minute and see what conclusions you draw from them. Oh, deductions. (laughs) Like a detective. To begin with, this house of yours is so full of, well, junk. I told you, Johnny, I like things. I like things. But it also has a lot of fine paintings, sculpture, china, jewelry. Oh, I like all sorts of things. Especially if they're fine and rare. And bargains. (laughs) Like the green eye of Calcutta? Oh, the most beautiful emerald in the world. And I would conclude that you'd do just about anything to have that stone. Yes, sir, Johnny. I'd reach the same conclusion. Okay. Now, when Albert Winkler and the Emerald disappeared, it was in the papers that Inter-Allied had written policies on them. Conclusion? Yes, sir. I would deduce that you would be called in. Wouldn't it be smart, then, if the killer was afraid I'd eventually get around to him anyway? Wouldn't it be smart for him to call me in and offer to help me? As a cover-up for what he'd done? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Or at least he'd think it would. Oh, yes, I, I guess he thought it would. Another thing, Mr. Blossom. Oh? What is it, Johnny? The body was packed in the trunk with old newspapers. Like these you keep piled around. Oh, why, yes, yes. And I would deduce... So deduced. obvious that both Randy Singer and I overlooked them completely. Oh, well, there are so many things piled around it. <laughs> you couldn't be expected as... Johnny. Yeah, What really made you decide that... uh... Well, I'd like to know. All right. Albert Winkler was a frail little old man, about 4'11", not much over 100 pounds. Yes, he was. But the man who bought the trunk and had it sent to Winkler's apartment, who gave his name as Winkler, 
That man was about 5'9", 155 pounds. And he wore thick, old-fashioned steel rim glasses. Oh, but Johnny, I can't see without them. Then there's the truck driver. The man who ordered the trunk delivered to this house gave his name as Winkler, too. But Winkler was dead by then. Dead from a blow inflicted not by some big bruiser, but by somebody of, say, your bill. Oh, that awful truck driver who thought the emerald would be in the trunk and came here to steal it and who beat me up. <sighs> I suppose you want the emerald. Yeah. Uh, here, Johnny, I, I kept it in this old coffee pot uh, that I picked up at an auction sale. Real bargain. Oh. oh. Isn't it a beautiful stone? Oh, if only Mr. Winkley would have sold it to me. At a bargain, that is. Then none of this would have happened. Well, I guess we better go now, haven't we? Huh. It's such a silly thing. Me trying to act like a detective. I guess I didn't even make a very good killer. Did I? Just this overpowering passion to have things? Maybe. Or maybe it was just a reaction. A last desperate attempt to some way, any way, break from a lifetime of lonely, dull, drab idleness. I don't know. But for some crazy reason, I feel sorry for the funny little old character who turned killer. Expense account total, including incidentals and fare, back to Hartford, $61.55. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a case so simple, so easy, so obvious, that it proves almost impossible to solve. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Howard McNear, Herb Ellis, Herb Vigran, Junius Matthews, Herb Butterfield, Frank Gersel, and Johnny Jacobs. Musical supervision is by Jerry Goldsmith. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Sure, pour me a cup, Gracie. You know, Maxwell House is always good to the last <laughs> drop. That drop's good, too. <laughs> yes, it's Maxwell House Coffee Time, starring George Burns and Gracie Allen.
with our special guest, Howard Duff, who is the famous detective Sam Spade. Yours truly, Toby Reed, Joseph Kearns, Eric Snowden, Harry Lubin, the Maxwell House Orchestra, and Bill Goodwin. For America's Thursday night comedy enjoyment, it's George and Gracie. And for America's everyday coffee drinking enjoyment, it's Maxwell House. Always good to the last drop. Many people say that Gracie is responsible for George being where he is today. And that's certainly true. Gracie is also responsible for Sam Spade being where he is today. You see, George and Sam Spade are both in jail. <laughs> How did it happen? Well, let's listen as George is being questioned by a police lieutenant. All right, let's start at the top. Name? George Burns. Occupation? I'm married to Gracie Allen. <laughs> no, 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 no. What do you do? What keeps you busy? I'm married to Gracie Allen. <laughs> Let me put it this way. What's your source of income? I'm married to Gracie Allen. <laughs> All right, skip it. What's your age? Approximately 42. How come you look older? I'm married to Gracie Allen. <laughs> What's your address? Please, 60 North Camden. All right, Burns, now suppose you tell me why you're in this jam. I'm married to Gracie Allen. <laughs> you're in a rut. Hey, Spade, how come you're in this jam? He's married to Gracie Allen. <laughs> you know, Burns, you and this Spade character are accused of murder. Now suppose you tell me the whole story right from the start. Okay, Lieutenant. It all started last Sunday night. I was sitting home listening to the radio with my wife. I'm married to, to Gracie, Gracie Allen. Allen. Yes, that part I know. Take it from there. Well, Gracie and I were listening to the adventures of Sam Spade. The, pro the program was just finishing. All right, Jenkins. Let's take a little ride down to headquarters. Me, sir? But I wouldn't murder Mr. Benson. I've been his butler for 20 years. Don't play innocent. I know you pulled this caper, and I've got enough evidence to put you right in the hot seat. But, Mr. Spade, I didn't do it. Say that malarkey for the warden. You were clever, Jenkins, but not clever enough. I think I'll call this the careless butler caper. Why did you turn off the radio, Gracie? Sam Spade got the wrong man tonight. What? I'm positive that Jenkins the butler wasn't guilty. An innocent man is going to get the hot plate. <laughs> hot seat. And don't worry. He'll only get it on the radio. Well, who cares where they put it? When he sits down, it'll burn. <laughs> oh, I, I've got to talk to Sam Spade right away. Honey, Sam Spade is not a real detective. I'll say he isn't. Any man who'd make an innocent butler sit on the hot plate... Hey, Gracie, he'll get a hot seat. Oh, he sure will after he sits on that hot plate. <laughs> Look, here's what I mean. On his program, Sam Spade is a private detective. But in real life, he's just an ordinary guy. Just like on your program, you're a nitwit. But in real life... <laughs> that won't work. Anyway, Gracie, what you just heard was only a radio program. I know that. The real crime happened last week. Every Sunday night, Sam Spade broadcasts his most thrilling case of the week. You still don't understand. Sam Spade is just a character. I'll say he's a character. <laughs> Making that poor innocent butler sit on a hot plate. Hot seat. Let me try to explain this once more. Sam Spade isn't even the fellow's real name. He's the brainchild of Dashiell Hammett. Oh, oh, you mean his real name is Sam Hammett? No, his real name is Howard Duff. Then why is his, uh, why isn't his father's name Dashiell Duff? <laughs> Look, Sam Spade doesn't have any actual father or mother. He came from Dashiell Hammett's typewriter. Oh, George, you're so innocent. <laughs> that old story about coming from under cabbage leaves, too. <laughs> What's the use? Okay, Sam Spade is a naughty detective, and he's sending an innocent butler to the hot plate. Hot seat. <laughs> Good night, dear. Good night. Well, Lieutenant, I didn't think any more about it. I was tired. It was past my bedtime. What time was it? It was after nine. Gee. <laughs> so I went to bed thinking Gracie would follow me. Instead, she followed Sam Spade. Oh, what do you mean? Uh, let me tell you about that part of it, Lieutenant. Okay, Spade. 
Well, I'd uh, finish my regular Sunday night show at the broadcasting studio, after which the actors lingered on for a little bull session. You know, who stepped on whose lines. I want a bigger part next week and so forth. So uh, it's about ten when I step out into the California night air, which is also about ten. But uh, <laughs> there's no snow, so I decide to walk home. I haven't taken two steps when this little lady grabs me by the sleeve and says... Are you Sam Stade? Well, if I had known then what I know now, I would have thrown myself under the wheels of a passing sunset bus. <laughs> but I'm a ham, and I figure she's maybe a fan, so I answer in my best Pasadena Playhouse voice. Why, yes, I'm Sam Spade. The butler didn't do it. Huh? You've got the wrong man. The butler didn't jerk that kipper. Jerk that kipper? Y yank that copper? You mean pull that caper? That's it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> You sent an innocent man to jail. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Lady, I think you're a little mixed up about me. I'm just an actor on CBS. That's what everybody says. <laughs> Look, uh, little lady, I'm tired. It's been a tough day. I'll uh, see you around, huh? Now, just a minute, Sam Spade. I heard you arrest that butler. Now, you've got to let him go free. You uh, wouldn't give me a rib, would you? Anything to free that butler. Which rib do you want? <laughs> I'll tell you what. Why don't you write me a letter with a dull pencil? Don't use anything sharp. Mm -hmm. I'll do better than that. I'll come to your office. Where is it? I haven't got an office. Oh, plain cagey, huh? All right. I'll come to your house. Where's that? Uh, three, two, one. Oh, no. I'm not talking. I want to get some sleep tonight. So long. So long. Why are you following me? What do you want? Got a cigarette? Sure. Here you are. Thanks. Got a match? Sure. Want me to light it for you? No, thanks. I don't smoke. <laughs> then why did you ask me for a cigarette? Well, I thought I'd better have it in case somebody asked me for one. <laughs> I see. Would you like a cigarette? No, thanks. Well, good night. Good night. Okay, okay. Now what? Got the time? Yeah, it's exactly 10-10. Uh, ten, ten. Thanks, thanks. No, I meant it's 10 minutes after 10. You're wrong. My watch says 15 after 10. You've got a watch? Sure. Then why did you ask me the time? Want a cigarette? <laughs> no. Well, good night. Good night. Look. Lady, stop following me. Oh, it's you again. <laughs> yeah, fancy meeting me here. Can I uh, give you the slip? Please. I couldn't accept a thing like that from a strange man. <laughs> All right, what do you want this time? Got a road map. A road map. Are you lost? No. May I make a suggestion? What? Get lost. <laughs> well, good night. Good night. Well, I've had enough of this little lady. You've seen the end of me. Yeah, for two blocks. <laughs> this time I'll lose you. Hey, uh, taxi, taxi. Let's get out of here, Cabby, but fast. <laughs> Cabby, pull up. That was real driving, buddy. Keep the change. Good night. Good night. Oh, no. Oh, no. How did you get here? On the back of that cab. <laughs> who are you, anyway? Oh, no, no. I'm too smart to tell you who I am. If I did, you'd complain to my husband, George Burns. <laughs> Oh, so you're Gracie Allen. How did you find out? You forget I'm a detective. Oh. And now I know what the National Safety Council means when they say, don't be a Gracie. Oh, never mind that. Are you going to let the butler go? Look, Gracie, there's really no butler in prison, and I'm not really Sam Spade. Oh, now, don't give me that story about your mother being a typewriter. <laughs> what? You're not talking to a child. I'm older than I look. 
Okay, Gracie, I see there's no use arguing with a smart girl like you. I'll see that the butler gets out. I'll get him the best mouthpiece in town. Get him out first. Fix his teeth later. <laughs> okay, okay. Good night. Well, Lieutenant, I thought that that would be the end of the episode. But it wasn't, huh? Brother, you haven't heard anything yet. The next morning... Uh, wait a minute, Mr. Burns. Before I listen any more of this story, I'll have to send out for some aspirin. Yeah. Have some of mine. Hey, how come you walk around with your pockets full of aspirin? I'm married to Gracie Allen. <laughs> One more thing before you go. Really appreciate you joining us for this compilation. If you would, take a minute to make sure you're subscribed. And if you enjoyed this compilation, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. The more likes we get, the more YouTube shares our videos with other viewers. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.